Hello, Christine, just uh, checking in with you. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I am good. Thank you. Good morning, Ramona. How are you doing? Oh, I'm muted. Good morning, Ramona. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Who am you I? For... Is that Teresa? Yes, I am the host. <laughs> I'm okay. doing that right now, changing my name so you can see it. Thank you okay. so much for uh, helping us out. You're very welcome. So I'll be recording as well. Okay. Thank you so much, Ramona. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I'll go ahead and go on mute. I'll stay um, off video. Okay. Because there's no reason for me to to be using a bandwidth. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I'm ready to go whenever you are. Okay, sounds good.
Good morning, Commissioner Jackson. Good morning, Sabina. Good morning, this is Commissioner Jackson. I was muted, I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. Welcome to the meeting. Thank you. I'll go back on mute until we get ready. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioner Parvanya. Good morning, how are you doing? I am good, thank you. Good morning, Chair Commissioner Downey. Good 
Good morning, Chair Commissioner Downey. Hello, well, can you hear me? Yes, Chair Commissioner okay. Downey, welcome. Thank you. Hi. Is that Teresa? Yes, this is. Hi. All right, thanks. Hello, all. Hello, Doug. How oh, are you? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is Dr. Sewell Hessen. Good morning, Commissioner Al Hassan. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Good. Morning, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Angela. Good morning. So I'm looking uh, for staff to confirm our attendance of our board members. Are we all are we all here? Yes, um, we are still waiting for Commissioner Allen. Commissioner Allen, okay. Uh, and we are waiting for uh, Commissioner Claire. Oh, uh, 
Senator, jo Senator Jones' office just arrived. Uh, we are waiting for Commissioner Mayenshine, and we are waiting for Commissioner Safarian. Okay, staff, are you already out looking to confirm they're having technical issues? Yes, um, someone is checking on Commissioner Claire, Commissioner Hurtado, Commissioner Mayenshine, and Commissioner Safarian. We are working on that currently. Okay. So it is, um, <clears throat> see, 10 01. And Chair uh, Downey, if you like to wait one more minute, we can do so. Okay, I'll give them a couple minutes. Okay. I want to publicly thank my friend, Sabina Wilford, who stepped in as our interpreter. We had a little bit of a challenge, but she is Johnny on the spot. And she's stepping in. Executive Director Jaman, uh, Commissioner Claire has just arrived. Okay, if we can just um, reconfirm commissioners, um, Marian, I would appreciate that. And then I, I would say then we should move as forward, uh, not to delay too long in our meeting plans. Commissioner Holloway has just been admitted. Welcome, Commissioner Holloway. We are still waiting on Commissioner Allen, Commissioner Hurtado, Commissioner Mayenshine, and Commissioner Safarian. Um, we do have a representative from Commissioner Hurtado's office. So we are still waiting for Commissioner Mayenshine and Commissioner Safarian right now. <clears throat> Executive Director Jermont, we have 15 commissioners uh, currently here out of the 17. Very good. Uh, Chair Downey, if you'd like to begin, I think we have a really strong representation for the meeting. Perfect. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. Uh, this is uh, uh, Chair Commissioner Downey, uh, and I'd like to welcome everybody. And then I'd like to uh, call, call to order this uh, meeting of the California Commission on Disability Access on this day, Wednesday, January 26, 2020. So, uh, Teresa, if you could please remove, uh, review our meeting instructions and protocols. Yes.
this full commission meeting will be on Zoom. and via teleconference only. There is no physical location being made available to the public in accordance with Assembly Bill 361, extending the Bagley King flexibility through March 31st, 2022. Teleconferencing restrictions are waived during the COVID-19 pandemic. Therefore, commission and committee members are not required to list their remote locations and members of the public may participate either by Zoom or teleconference from any location. This meeting is being captioned and recorded. To assist in this effort, please state your first and last name each time you speak and speak loud and clear. The live captioning link has been included in the chat for your use. Public participants can use the raise hand function to alert the committee of when they would like to speak. And we will also give an opportunity for public members who have called in to the meeting at which time they can unmute themselves. If you are attending this meeting via teleconference, please press star six on your keypad to unmute or mute yourself. If you would like to alert CCDA, please press star nine to telephonically raise your hand and staff will call on you. Please remember to mute yourself if you are not speaking in order to reduce noise. If you are having technical issues throughout the meeting and need assistance, please use the chat function to alert CCDA staff or email ccda at dgs.ca.gov. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, with that, I'd like to, for us to um, uh, state the Pledge of Allegiance. So all those, those that can, please stand. And uh, Executive Director Jamat, could you confirm that there's a flag behind you there? Yes, correct. All right, thank you. So um, let's go. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, the United States of America. Of America and to the Republic, the Republic for, for which, which it, stands, it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God, indivisible, liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you. So with that, uh, I'd like to move on to, I believe it's agenda item. Uh, actually, uh, Teresa, uh, could you please take roll? Yes. Chair, Commissioner Downey. Present. Vice Chair Commissioner <clears throat> Wheely. Present, thank you. Immediate past Chair Commissioner Lemus. Present. Commissioner Allen. Commissioner Allen. Commissioner Dillard. Here. Commissioner El Hessen. Present. Commissioner Holloway. Present. Commissioner Jackson. Present. Commissioner Leon Vasquez. Present. Commissioner Lillibridge. Here. Commissioner Paravagna. Present. Commissioner Claire. Present. Commissioner Hartado. Uh, Akash Vashi on behalf of Senator Hurtado. Thank you. Commissioner Jones. Nina Crushell on behalf of Commissioner Jones. Thank you. Commissioner Mayenshine. Commissioner Mayenshine. Commissioner Nguyen. Justin Romero here on behalf of Assemblywoman Wynn. Thank you. Commissioner Safarian. Commissioner Safarian. Chair Commissioner Downey, we do have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, are there other um, mem uh, uh, commissioners or uh, senators uh, on the line that need to be identified? Stephanie, um, 
Are there any other individuals that we have not uh, noted yet that you have on your attendance list? Um, I do have uh, information on um, Commissioners Tiffany Allen and Anthony Safarian. Tiffany Allen is unable to be here, as is uh, Anthony Safarian, who is um, busy with work today. Um, and then uh, we have the representative from Brian W. Jones, as previously noted, uh, Preston Romero from the Office of the Assembly uh, Woman, uh, Janet Nguyen. Um, Chair Commissioner Downey, uh, that is the confirmation of okay. all of the commissioners. All right, well, thank you. Uh, and then are there, if there are members of the public that would like to uh, uh, identify themselves, you please do so at this time. Charlene Ornelas. Chair Commissioner Downey, we have a hand raised from uh, Christine Fitzgerald. Uh, I believe she'd like to identify herself. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Christine Fitzgerald. I'm the community advocate for the Silicon Valley Independent Living Center. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public wishing to identify themselves? My name's Michelle Mashburn. I'm also um, a member of the community. I am a disabled advocate activist in Santa Clara County. Thank you. Chair Commissioner Downey, I do not see any hands raised for any other um, indications okay. that they would like to be. Oh, excuse me. Chair Commissioner Downey, a hand was just raised okay. from uh, Molly who would like to identify herself as well. Good morning, my name is Molly McLeod. I am a, a resident of San Jose, California uh, with a disability and active in the disability showing up for racial justice, um, cross disability national organization. Thanks. Thank you. Chair, um, Commissioner Downey, I believe David Peters also want to identify himself. He is having issues with his microphone, but he okay. wanted to be acknowledged. So this is Commissioner Downey. Can you repeat his name again? Um, David. His name is David Peters. All right. He has no microphone, but okay. he would like to be identified as being in okay. the meeting. All right. Thank you. Um, I've checked the chat and I do not see any indication for any other individuals who would like to be acknowledged, Chair Commissioner Downey. Okay, thank you. So then with that, we'll move on to agenda item number two, uh, the approval of the meeting minutes from our last full commission hearing back on October, uh, let's see, uh, October 27, 2021. So um, assuming you all have had a chance to review that, uh, are there any questions? Move approval of the minutes, Chair uh, Commissioner Holloway. Thank you. I'll second Commissioner L. Hessen. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. The motion is passed. So for agenda item number three, uh, CCDA uh, uh, service commemorations. So for that, I'll turn it over to our executive director, Angela Jama. Yes, if I can get off mute, I can start. Yeah. I indeed um, take great pleasure in this section of our agenda. We uh, began discussion of recognizing and commemorating those who have served excellently uh, for this board and our community uh, at the executive meeting. And um, with that said, we wanted to translate that opportunity here at the full commission meeting um, 
with a few recognitions, as well as an opportunity for all of you to comment if you choose to do so. Um, and we will begin by acknowledging our first, uh, which started an executive meeting, acknowledging uh, Rex Hines. Rex Hines um, had served as the president of the California Business Properties Association for over 37 years. And he has now transitioned to a level of advisory to that board uh, so, uh, association. But more importantly, we wanted to share with you the impact he has uh, made for the commission at this point of transition in his career. Uh, CCDA actually has a seat on this commission that is held by um, our vice chair, Doug Wheely, in association to his hard work of creating and being a part of the uh, mind uh, development of this organization called the California Commission on Disability Access. He and others work together to, to create an opportunity for us to exist. And not only did he participate in that, all through the, our years of existence, Rex Hines has supported this board and has been diligently supporting to help us become a vital existence to the state government. And so he has um, a number of um, celebrations throughout California this uh, in the next couple of months. And so we will actually be participating in that uh, celebration with a resolution in a couple of months. So we wanted just to acknowledge the fact that we have created a resolution in, or in the, particip uh, in the process of developing that resolution. And we wanted to now to um, have a few more words through our vice chair to even uh, give more greater impact understanding why he's so important to CCDA. Commissioner Wheeling. Thank you, Angela. This is Commissioner Wheeling, and I appreciate the opportunity to share some sentiments about Rex's involvement with CCDA. California Business Properties Association is known as the legislative watchdog for the commercial real estate industry in California. We monitor the activities of the governor's office and the legislature and participate in uh, the work of the legislature as to the interests of commercial real estate. As Angela mentioned uh, a number of decades ago, uh, early in the years of the ADA, Rex recognized that there must be some forum for communication between the business community, the small business community on the one hand and the disability commu uh, community on the other hand, other than in front of a judge in court. And so Rex approached the California Centers for Independent Living with the suggestion of what is now the California Commission on Disability Access, a forum for dialogue, a forum for understanding of each other's needs and interests, an alternative to litigation. And, and that conversation with California Centers for Independent Living resulted in CCDA. Um, we're very grateful for that. One of the provisions in the formation of CCDA was uh, that the California Business Properties Association would have the opportunity for a representative from CBPA's board to serve on the Disability Commission. And I'm the second from uh, CBPA to do so. Uh, I was preceded by Mike Dean for the first five years of CCDA. Mike retired from his practice as an attorney and Rex approached me and asked if I would be willing to serve. And as you know, this has been a great a great experience for me, both uh, getting to understand the disability community better myself and to serve the interests of CPPA. Um, Rex is overdue in retiring. Rex is a long-term cancer survivor. He's fought the good fight. He remains in good health uh, with uh, regular chemotherapy, but it's time for Rex to step 
aside and he has done so or is yeah, as of the first of the year he's now in an advisory role but there is a celebration coming up at the Hyatt Regency in Sacramento late in the afternoon on the 16th open to anybody that wants to drop by a reception uh, there's a big 50th anniversary of California Business Properties Association and a Rex Heim retirement event in late March in Newport Beach uh, to which we are invited and uh, I just want to publicly acknowledge to all of us uh, what a great service I believe Rex has provided to the Disability Commission and to all of us. Thank, thank you, Commissioner Whaley. Um, you have shared uh, many of the thoughts that uh, so many folks have uh, felt about his uh, participation and uh, the creation of CCDA and our success. And so thank you for giving that historical um, viewing. Are there any other comments regarding uh, Rex Hines? And as uh, mentioned, um, both Commissioner Lemus and Commissioner Alsan has indicated they will be also joining um, myself uh, at the presentation of the resolution. So as I shared, um, we um, felt it was a, a good season, a good time. We, we've been um, dealing with so much during this pandemic season and, um, and just good to say thank you. And as we started this uh, agenda topic of Rex Hines, we also wanted to transition to additional thank yous. Um, with that said, we are also um, presenting, and this is a, going to be a little bit of a tricky thing. We're, we're learning how to present and think about how to recognize in this Zoom uh, virtual world, but we did want to take the time to acknowledge our immediate past president. And is he on um, non, I don't see him, his, see that he's linked up to the top, but if we could pin him to the top for those who may not um, have in their view, I know we're all on different devices. And so we may only see one person, but nevertheless, um, Commissioner um, Guy Lemus, we want to take the time today to just one to thank you for your service of, of 10 years as the chair of CCDA. This uh, season, as many of you know, CCDA, the California Commission on Disability Access, uh, started. We also have screen text, though. That, that is. Um, Stephanie, you're not on mute. Um, so we also. We, so many of you know that um, we started on a bootstring. We started with a few commissioners and not a lot of money <laughs> to do the things we were mandated to do, but had the heart and desire to do it. Because as Commissioner Wheelie said, we saw this as a good thing and we wanted to see it to fruition. And with that said, we just wanted to pause to also acknowledge extremely difficult season to get CCDA where we are today. And that was through some um, fearless leadership of our, our immediate past chair, and that's Guy Lemus. So, so Mr. Lemus has also been uh, recognized by the legislation and with a resolution that we will be presenting at a later date um, of which we will acknowledge his service to this commission. And truly we acknowledge that fact that while he, this is a good time not to wait to their, what we say dead and gone, but rather to acknowledge them why they're here and acknowledge the fact that we appreciate the work he has done for this commission. Um, the words are a few on a resolution, but it's very greatly felt by many of us. So at this point, um, I see he said, thank you uh, in the chat. 
Is there any other words that may be wanted to be commented on uh, at this time? Excuse me. Uh, yes. I just wanted to say thank you. That's very sweet. I've enjoyed my time on the commission. And as we all know, this is my last tour of duty. It's been almost 10 years and um, I've enjoyed every step of it. And I continue to look forward to the work we still will accomplish. So thank you very much for that thoughtful gesture. And Commissioner Downey, I think you were just about to comment as well. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say I, how much I appreciate his leadership over the, all this time. Uh, uh, Commissioner Guy Lima was, was uh, sworn in as chair in my uh, first uh, commission hearing. So to me, uh, CCDA is it's been it's his stamp is all over that in terms of what it is, how we work, the success that he's been able to uh, usher in, and uh, solving so many issues and challenges. So it's it's uh, quite a pleasure and somewhat daunting to follow in his footsteps, but do so with great confidence given the tremendous leadership he's given us over all these years. So thank you, Guy. We also, thank you. We also wanted to, well, we wanted to um, bring a really high recognition and and I want to pause a little bit also just to thank uh, Assembly Person Nguyen's office and of the leadership to provide the resolutions for both Rex Himes and Guy Lemus. Um, her staff is amazing and has taken on the leadership of the resolutions to include all our board and legislative board members to be on the resolution. And so thank you, uh, Assembly uh, Member Nguyen Office for that service. We also have for, not as a resolution, but still a heartfelt recognition of Commissioner Anthony Safarian. And this certificate it's also just to acknowledge and thank you for he is our only founding member remaining on the board. He came with us in 2009 and is still have been serving, although he's not here today, we won't knock that against him. <laughs> but um, he has served so well for since 2009, since the beginning of the board. And I don't know if many of you have known that, but he has been here that long. Um, and one of the things that really that stands strong in my mind that I wanted to acknowledge of his service is because when we were trying to get started in collecting cases, we had no legal mind to do so. And we were trying to interpret it how to categorize under his leadership and the actual um, staff that he has within the Department of Justice he collected and had his uh, clerks help us develop these categories. He helped us define them. He, he helped us re, uh, read and, and learn how to read cases. That was under his leadership that I truly am appreciative of and has helped us become the experts, not legal, don't let anyone say we quote it, that we're legal experts, but we have been able to do our jobs well because of his support. So thank you, Commissioner uh, Safarian, and we will be sending this certificate to your office in recognition of that. This next one is a certificate, and it's more, not a certificate, but it's a letter to just thank Commissioner Allen. She's acknowledged that she has enjoyed her time, but she's actually leaving the state of California to move to Texas. And so we wanted to just thank her for her participation with us on this commission, as well as thank her for all the work she does in the state of California. Uh, when I met her, I went down to Fresno for um, a meeting with um, a number of disability communities. I, I met with almost every major uh, disability community and every single one of them said, you need to meet Tiffany Allen. I said, wait a minute, you guys, she's on my board. <laughs> and it was so proud 
for me to say that, but they saw her as a key person to know. And I was like proud to say she's with us. She's on our team. So um, we wanted to send her a thank you for her participation and a farewell to her endeavors in Texas. I know she's going to make Texas proud that she, she is with them and serving there. So uh, thank you to her. And then the last one we want to uh, say is, and this is like, wow, CCD has some amazing chairs. Do not, be, do not take that for granted. We have um, want to take the time to acknowledge that Commissioner Downey um, has been um, elected or, or voted in to serve as the inaugural uh, professor of, and at the Practice and Social Justice Department of Ar um, Architects and the, in the College of Environmental Design. He has been given this um, opportunity to serve as a professor because of all the work he's done over these last decades. Um, and many of you have known that Commissioner Downey has been um, amazing a trailblazer of serving and identifying that you can do anything with your mindset to do excellence. And that is what he represents and why he has been identified as the inaugural professor for social justice and department of architect. He will share exactly who he represents as he becomes this um, professor but I definitely want to give a shout out and have the board acknowledge and recognize the work that he's done and work he's going to be doing under this leadership opportunity. So Commissioner Downey, if you may uh, share a little bit more about how uh, this professorship has been created as well as um, what you're expecting to do and why. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Executive Director Jamal. Uh, it's, uh, for me, it's most, I'd like to celebrate what uh, has been done through Professor Emeritus Ray Lifshe for the Cal University of California Berkeley College of Environmental Design and endowing a, a visiting professor of practice in social justice in the areas of disability uh, and social justice. Uh, Ray, uh, Professor Lishe, uh has uh, taught at the school for over 50 years, starting in the early 70s, and at the time was a leader uh, admitting uh, students with disabilities into the program, the first to do that, and then going further to, to engage members of the dis disability community in Berkeley as clients and consultants to his uh, undergraduate architecture studios, design studios that he led for, for decades there at Cal. Uh, so he's a, he's a leader. He was ahead of his time, uh, active in the disability, in, de, in the independence living movement, uh, and is, was actually recognized, I believe it was in 2018, by the Center for Independent Living, CIL in Berkeley, uh, uh, bestowing upon him the Ed Roberts uh, Award. Um, so uh, he's also a, a co-producer, uh, along with the Obamas, of the Crip Camp film that was released, I believe it was the summer of 2020 or 2021, I've forgotten at this point. But anyway, uh, truly a leader in this area, and he has endowed this chair as a visiting professorship to rotate every semester between the various departments of architecture, landscape architecture, regional planning, uh, and uh, city and regional planning, and environmental uh, uh, planning. So it's a remarkable legacy that he's leaving behind uh, at leaving to this College of Environmental Design at the University of California, Berkeley, something that will sort of instill, sort of bake this in to the education there to be every year, every semester, having these studios be taught in the area of social justice and disability uh, uh, community. So it's, it's quite an honor to be the inaugural recipient, but all honors go to Professor Ray Lifshe and his leadership in this area and his decision to endow this chair uh, for per perpetuity for the College of Environmental Design at Cal. So thank you. 
So thank you. And I, I guess let's just give a round of applause for all these folks we've acknowledged at this uh, time. I, I know we're taking some pictures of all this and my staff. So that'll be a great picture. Remember, I'm, I'm indirectly talking to some folks. So um, thank you all for the work you do, have done, and continually to make CCDA thrive. Um, we know we're excellent because of each person on this board. And so thank you all. Thank you for uh, Rex and his supporting all the folks a part of this organizational uh, stakeholder collection of folks who really work hard to keep us going and, and having us higher heights. So with that said, um, we have finished agenda number three and we're on to um, agenda number four, Commissioner Downey. Yeah, thank you. So, um... This is Commissioner Downey again. And so agenda item number four, uh, member, uh, comments from members of the public on items that are not on the agenda. So uh, do we have any members of the community of the public that would like to speak? Yes, so Scott, um, Chair, uh, Chair Commissioner Downey, yes. uh, we are looking through the chat. Uh, Stephanie, would you read off the first person who of would course. like to speak? So Christine Fitzgerald, you raised your hand first. And actually, before we start with that, how many do we have a count of how many members of the public that would like to speak? Of course, Ch uh, Chair Downey. Uh, so we have two at this time. OK, thank you. So Christine Fitzgerald, you raised your hand first. Would you please begin? Thank you very much. I'd just like to make a suggestion at this minute. Um, in your um, instructions to log into this uh, conversation, the Zoom link is great. I'd like to make a suggestion and do a one tap setup for um, those that are um, Phoning in, I don't know about anybody else, but my memory is horrible. And trying to remember the passcode to log in is a royal pain in the rear, especially if you're using a screen reader like I do. So thank you. Thank you. Chair Commissioner Downey, we also have Molly McLeod. Her hand is raised as well. All right. Thank you, Molly. Good morning. My name is Molly McLeod. Um, I am uh, wearing my favorite Access is Love sweatshirt with the heart in the middle of the O. Um, I am a woman in my mid-50s with short gray hair, um, she, her pronouns. And I would find it helpful if... Um, each speaker says their name first. It's a way not only to learn the respectful pronunciation of people's names, but it also um, helps for tracking conversations. For the beginning of this, I have been you know, on the phone. Um, usually it helps to have um, the um, captions and transcripts, which I, I found um, on here, but those would be my first suggestions. I wanna uh, point out that um, the, there's an opportunity to um, look at our own uh, level of familiarity with uh, access practices. Mine have developed a lot more in the last couple of years because of participating in cross-disability um, organizations. Um, I would say that the, the level of practice at uh, local, um, regional, and state government is uh, very low. And, um, you know, so basic things like using the accessibility checker on all documents, PowerPoints, et cetera. Remembering to, if you're on Zoom and don't have a separate caption to turn on the automated um, Zoom. To be uh, responsive, I sent out a email to the 15 cities or towns in Santa Clara County and, and the county itself asking for um, the contact information of the ADA coordinator um, something that should be provided uh, routinely and available. It's not evident on all of um, the websites. I got a total of two responses. Um, the city of San Jose, which will be making a presentation later, is one of 
uh, only two of the largest uh, 20 cities that don't have an Office of Disability Affairs. Um, I am thankful that um, with the work of, of disabled residents like Christine Fitzgerald and most especially uh, Michelle Mashburn also on this call, that both the city and the county are looking at creating Office of Disability Affairs. Um, the day-to-day -day, um, ableism and access barriers is huge. So one suggestion for all folks that I would have here is um, in social media, uh, use your um, hashtag uh, and capitalize each word, access is love, for example, and um, make sure you include live links and then provide ways to get that feedback like Christine provided on the, the memory part. For me, I'm uh, attending this meeting on my day off from work um, but I'm also uh, going to be sitting outside the hospital taking my sister to an appointment for a, a serious emerging medical condition. Because this means so much, I'm here with you virtually. Um, but know that each of us carries so many other stories and um, about the barriers that we're encountering on a all the time basis. So thank you for your work and your listening. Thank you. Chair Commissioner Downey, we have uh, Charlene Ornelas, who's next in the line for comments. Thank you. Yes, this, this is kind of in a different uh, direction, but it's a disability issue and really makes a big uh, difference in lives of certain individuals. And that is the issue with fake service dogs. We. Um, California is one of the first states that actually made it against the law to have profess a dog to be a service dog when it's not. And you can see a lot of promotion of these dogs by Facebook, um, a lot of different other locations. It'll say, don't leave your pet at home. Here's a hint right here. They know the, what they're doing. Take it with you. Get certified to have your you know, pet um, be a service animal and pay us X amount of money. We'll certify it. Well, first of all, there's no no certification if anybody knows that. But the other thing is these dogs are barking out of control and they're causing problems with people who do have service dogs. California made it a lot that it's like I said against to to profess, profess that your dog is a service dog when it's not. But it becomes a very much of a dis or a, a misdemeanor. And on the priorities, if I were to call the police, they'll just say, well, call animal control. Well, that will take me forever. If my dog is being threatened, has been attacked by a fake service dog, my life could be at danger because my dog is not functioning. I may not be able to get home with it. My dog may be shook up for, for a while. My dog may be totally ruined. I had one that was. And so it needs to be brought up that this can be a um, 911 call to the police department because my life is at, at risk and the life of my dog um, just because of the circumstances. Thank you. Chair Commissioner Downey, we have a hand raised from uh, Christine Fitzgerald. Okay, and do we have any others beyond that? Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, Chair Commissioner Downey. Uh, Michelle Mashburn raised her hand first, then Christine Fitzgerald, my apologies. Uh, okay. I'm sorry, let me jump in because I think, um, Teresa, I think that we already had her speaking, if that's correct. So I think you're, we're on Michelle. Oh, not... my apologies. Um, yes, it is Christine Fitzgerald, my apologies. No, what I'm saying is Michelle is our speaker, public speaker. And we had Christina speak once. Is that correct? In my, yes. I think her hand was just still up. And it... no, I am asking to speak again. Thank you. So, um, again, this is Angela Jaman, executive director for the commission, and. We do not have the opportunity for repeated uh, comments. If you like to su submit that to uh, the CCDA, um, to our direction, I would 
greatly appreciate that for the sake of time. And we do have, because we do have one more speaker, uh, public comment, and that is Michelle Hashburn. And, and so Michelle, uh, please. Thank you. Um, sometimes managing meetings can be difficult and I understand that and appreciate everybody taking the time to be here today. My name is Michelle Mashburn. I'm a disabled and activist and advocate, as I said earlier, in Santa Clara County. I'm also the director of a small nonprofit locally in this county. I want to call into the room that ableism is the core barrier that prevents equity and inclusion of disabled people. Um, physical access can be 100% there and stamped approved, whereas that ableism is what prevents me from going into that space that was deemed physically accessible. Um, because the policies and practices and procedures fail to meet the needs and fail to consider the needs of disabled people. Um, I would like to respectfully ask that this commission start to look at that internalized ableism that we all carry with us to create the solutions to bridge between the businesses that fear for their money and well-being because, you know, ADA lawsuits are expensive and shift to realizing that through inclusion and, and measures of equity, we can gain more than we've gained or maybe regain some of what was gained as the ADA stagnated and kind of became less about disabled, true disabled disability access, inclusion and equity versus being just about physical barriers. So we need to include the attitudinal barriers and I thank you all for being here. Thank you. Uh, Chair Commissioner Downey, I do not see any other hands raised or any comments in the chat. Okay, thank you. So with that, we'll move on to agenda item number five, which is, is the uh, discussion on, uh, sorry, I'm going back to my screen reader here. Uh, the discussion on the Title III, alleged Title III, uh, alleged violations of cities, um, yes. So I'll turn it over to Angela Jamat to uh, introduce this topic. Thank you, Chair Downey. It's um, something that we consider to be very proud of heritage that CCDA has continually to work with uh, various cities throughout California. Um, and working on this very topic, we, we recognize that we have our responsibilities, but we do it in partnership. And so, as uh, you have heard on a number of our presentations of, that we've met with particular cities, uh, we're proud to say we met with uh, the city of San Jose and have been engaging in a number of conversations with this city about the work that they're doing. And with that said, they have graciously agreed to share some of the work that they're doing in their particular city with us today. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, what I believe to be um, our full range of speakers. And if, if I have um, incorrectly identified them, <coughs> um, they'll correct me, I'm sure. But let me just read with you uh, a little bit of our first uh, presenter. And, and that is uh, the vice mayor, uh, Charles Jones, and they um, graciously call him Chappie uh, Jones. But vice mayor uh, Jones was elected, and I'm going to read in, uh, a portion of his bio that we have um, available, but I will be reading only a portion of all the presenters' bio. So uh, team, you don't need to present um, anything on the screens going forward. But uh, the vice, pre uh, vice mayor uh, Jones was elected to the San Jose City Council in November of 2014. Um, he was appointed as vice mayor in 2019. And he represents the city council district one, <clears throat> the region of West San Jose. Uh, Vice Mayor Jones uh, was born in Sacramento, but moved to San Jose in the nineties. So I'm proud to say he's, he's a part of the state capital um, in bread. Uh, his upbringing instilled him a strong sense of civic uh, responsibility. Uh, prior to his election, he worked in the private sector where he held sales management positions with Apple and AT&T and was a senior executive with the Cornerstone Consulting Technology and owned a technology service business. Uh, Vice Mayor Jones currently serves as, on several regional boards 
and agencies, including as chair of the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority and president of the city's association of Santa Clara County. He and his council colleagues uh, work um, to raise um, in what they consider to make a better place to live, work in uh, for all their families, prioritizing uh, issues addressing trans uh, innovation for transition and mobility solution, affordable housing, public safety, uh, digital access and opportunities for the most vulnerable of our communities. So we want to again, welcome Vice Mayor uh, Chappie Jones. Joining him is his um, de Deputy Chief of Staff of his office, and that's Rainey Mosin, who has worked over 18 years as a public policy and government relationships um, in both the local and state agencies in the Bay Area. Um, and her state um, level of service was in the state Senate, and, and now she's serving locally in San Jose. Additionally, uh, with the mayor, vice mayor is Juan Ha, and she is from, she's an analyst from the Planning and Building and Codes Enforcement Department of San Jose. Did I have all your speakers in line that we are sharing for your presentation, uh, Vice Chair, uh, Vice Mayor Jones? Uh, we have one additional person too, that's uh, Tom Westfall, who's in our Office of Intergovernmental Relations, who's also with us. Very good, welcome and thank you so much. And we look forward to your presentation. Okay, well, well, thank you, Angela and um, CCDA for um, inviting me to participate in this meeting. Um, it's also good to see uh, Molly McLeod, who's been a strong advocate of uh, issues and policies that uh, affect the disabled community. So it's good to see that she's in the audience. I got um, some slides I'd like to share. So I'm gonna ask for permission to share them. And can you see my slides? Okay. All right, um, so first of all, I, well, again, I wanna thank um, your group for inviting me. It's been an interesting process that we've been on in an interesting journey. Um, so I'm gonna cover a couple of different areas. One is our current city programs facilitating ADA compliance, um, some of the policy proposals um, in response to the CCDA 2020 annual report, and then also next steps. So we in San Jose, 96% or 96.6% of all businesses are made up of small and minority owned businesses. Um, for the past three years, our, our San Jose Small Business Advisory Task Force has been um, looking at this issue of drive-by lawsuits that have been significantly impacting our small business uh, and minority, particularly our minority-owned business community. Um, there's been a significant increase in cases involving these lawsuits. And for our minority and ethnically owned communities who own businesses, it's been a, a significant hardship. So we, we had access in to the CCDA 2020 annual report that to our surprise identified San Jose with the highest number of reported alleged Title III disability access violations across the state. That was 237 complaints out of 3,621. This brought um, a higher level of concern to our task force. So in October 14th, 2021, our members met with this additional information and data and it increased our level of concern and desire to do something about the, the issue. So 
So before I go on to uh, provide additional uh, detail, I'm gonna hand it over to Swan Ha, who's gonna um, give you more background and information about some of the programs and initiatives that we're implementing in the city. So Han, can you uh, share your screen? Yes, thank you, Vice Mayor Jones. Um, uh, I cannot share my screen. I'll, I'll try it right now, thank you. There you go. Hello everyone, my name is Swan Ha. I'm one of the cities of San Jose Small Business Ally, and my role is to help customers through the city's developmental processes in order to open their small business. Our team serves as the customer's point of contact for all city processes. And even though we work with interdepartmental staff, we primarily assist small businesses through the building plan check and inspection processes, and therefore are housed in the planning, building and code enforcement department. I'm here today to um, speak with you regarding how our building division has been utilizing the disability access and, and education revolving fund. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as the law directed, the fund has been used to increase CAS training and certification within the building divisions, planning, um, planning reviewers and inspectors. And as a part of a, the building plan review for any project that triggers a building permit for new constructions or um, renovations projects, the building division staff continues to review and require ADA accessibility compliance. As for existing businesses um, or turnkey operations where businesses have been running for many, many years, decades even, um, that don't require a building permit through, through the process, we launched a CAS grant program in early 2022, um, 2020 to assist small businesses um, with removing barriers that prevent their site from being fully accessible or usable by individuals with disabilities. And um, this grant, our goal is to encourage small businesses to make voluntary upgrades to their site. And um, throughout our outreach meetings and um, uh, outreach endeavors, we want to remind small business owners and property owners that they have an ongoing obligation to ensure that individuals with disabilities are not excluded from services because their facility are unusable or inaccessible to them. And therefore, this grant will credit up to $8,000 to qualifying existing small businesses for the cost to hire a private certified access specialist to prepare a CAS inspection report for their site. Um, so the CAS inspection report would identify um, compliance issues at the property and it would help them create a plan to fix those issues within a reasonable time. The grant would also credit the project for city permits and inspection fees relating to the corrective accessibility improvements as identified in the inspection report. And as an ongoing effort to assist small businesses, um, Tom um, Westfall with the San Jose City Manager's Office, who's um, present here in this meeting, um, is collaborating with the Office of Assembly Member Alex Lee to propose a legislation to remove the $4 fee that is scheduled to sunset on January 1st, 2024. And therefore this will allow local governments to continue to collect the $4 disability access and education revolving fund indefinitely. And in addition, this bill will also propose to enumerate and expand local jurisdictions ability to use the funds 
and to create and implement more programs and services to facilitate accessibility compliance. Thank you very much for your time. And now I would like to turn it back to Vice Mayor Jones. Thank you. And I will share my screen again. Give me a second here. So this um, didn't happen in a vacuum. And again, I wanted to uh, reinforce that um, a lot of our policy initiatives really came from the collaboration that we had with uh, CCDA and, and particularly working with Angela. So we developed a multi-pronged uh, strategy. Uh, the goal was to create uh, inclusive, barrier-free and accessible commercial space for residents and visitors and create an environment where our businesses uh, may prosper. Um, I have to be honest with you that um, before we engage with CCDA, that uh, really our viewpoint and strategy to address the, um, the drive-by lawsuits and the, the challenges that our small businesses were having was more of a, what I refer to as a, a fight or flight type of response where we were trying to figure out ways where we could work with our small businesses and minority owned businesses to figure out how to, to fight these lawsuits, to uh, get resources to, um, you know, really push back against what was happening. And I think that there was a real shift in our approach and viewpoint and outlook in terms of how to handle and address these situations. And, and again, I just want to just give um, Angela and, and CCDA so much credit for really helping us make that transition and shift from a, how do we fight these lawsuits um, from, from that to how do we work with the agencies and resources and individuals who can help us collaborate and work with these small businesses to be able to address, fix, or mitigate the, the challenges and barriers that uh, our disabled community were having to access their facilities. So part of that multi-pronged strategy was to increase education, also increase uh, outreach and promotion, provide new grant programs that would cover construction related ADA violation corrections, and then also obviously advocacy. The first part of that was an education campaign, um, having mailers, flyers, updating our city website, uh, providing tools and resources so that our small business community can, can really access the information they need to address their um, potential ADA violations. And I just wanna tell you a real quick story. Actually, a small business reached out to me literally yesterday uh, they, the owner has an ice cream shop and he had an ADA um, lawsuit filed against him in 2013 that cost him eventually $18,000 to, to uh, resolve. The actual cost to fix the violation was $400. So he calculated that it would cost him or he would have to sell 4,500 ice cream cones to pay for the cost of repairing the uh, violation and paying the additional legal fees and other, other fines. Now he's being hit with another lawsuit just the other day. And he came to me asking for help because he heard that I was involved with trying to address these ADA lawsuits. Um, so this is a real world example of a small business 
that's being significantly impacted by these lawsuits. And also it's another example in terms of someone reaching out, trying to get information because they didn't, even though they've been through this process once before, they really didn't know where to, to find information to help them you know, deal with this situation. So education campaign is critical, uh, updating our, again our city resources, providing city sponsored webinars and partnering with uh, compliance experts is critical. And another critical component too is targeting um, the multilingual community. Uh, there's been numerous incidents where someone whose English is not their first language has been approached by these individuals who are filing lawsuits. And because of the language barriers and because of the cultural you know, issues that they have in terms of being approached by someone who represents a position of authority, there's a lot of intimidation that's going on. There's a lot of misunderstanding. There's a lot of mis miscommunication that's creating additional barriers for those businesses to be able to access the information they need to address the violation and then move forward with their business. Um, outreach and promotion of proposed initiatives is, is critical to our strategy. Um, we, as been mentioned uh, by Swan, you know, we have a $8,000 small business credit, but there's really been a lack of um, uh, usage of those programs because, again, of the lack of information and knowledge out there in the business community that these types of grants programs are even available. We discovered that it's definitely critical to partner with third party organizations and, and agencies and government entities. Um, and really um, moving forward with some of our city initiatives like our Alfresco Forever program, which allows outside dining and making sure that when these programs are uh, stood up and ongoing, that we have the proper ADA compliance already built in from the beginning and we don't have to retrofit it after the fact. And then uh, establishing forms for citizens to be able to communicate um, their concerns. Um, we have individuals, again, like Molly McLeod, who are on the forefront of advocating for um, uh, programs in departments like at the Potential Office of Disability Affairs, which we have allocated $150,000 to, to um, evaluate um, potentially having that office stood up. But we need more individuals like, like Molly and other concerned residents to provide their input so that we can move some of these initiatives forward. And then new grant programs. Um, one of the things that we um, realize is that there's, there, there is an access and there are funds out there that again, the small business community is not aware of, but we have to make it seamless for them to be able to tap into and access those funds. Um, we, in our um, fund for, um, disability related uh, improvements, uh, the, we discovered that there were $800,000 in that fund that we weren't even aware of. And it wasn't until we started this process that we were able to identify that we did have funds available that could be used by the small business community to address some of these uh, ADA compliance issues. So we have to you know, build up those funds we have to advocate with, with our state partners to be able to continue those programs and continue to have them funded. Um, there's a good example of um, how we can partner with a, an organization like CCDA, and that is um, their, the California Technology Revolving Fund is, is a, a, a great example of um, our city of San Jose leveraging a relationship with a fund like that to provide grants to small businesses. And I'd like to see um, a partnership similar to that with uh, an agency like CCDA. And then finally, um, advocacy. Um, we were able to get um, Assembly Member Alex Lee to author a bill to move forward with the uh, Disability Access and Education Revolving Fund. 
and keep the fee at $4, where the city will be able to retain 90% of that. And, and again, um, being able to leverage um, different agencies to, to move forward with how we utilize those funds, being able to, to maintain those funds on an ongoing basis is critical for us. And then finally, what are some of the next steps? Uh, so we had a proposal that was approved by our rules committee in December, on December 8th, 2021, that was reviewed by council. And uh, it will be reviewed by council in February of 2022. And hopefully that will be approved. Um, again, mentioned that we are um, seeking and have sought and are getting sponsorship and support from our, for some of our initiatives by the assembly members, particularly assembly member Lee. And we are also in the process of considering establishing an office of disability, which we have provided funding. And most importantly, uh, continuing our collaboration with CCDA to move our initiatives and, and projects and proposals forward. So it's an exciting time. Um, we have a long way to go, but we're very, um, encouraged by the progress that we've made. So that's pretty much sums up um, you know, my presentation. Again, I just want to reiterate you know, just the value that CCDA has provided with us in terms of education, in terms of data and analytics, uh, providing a forum for collaboration uh, that we're looking forward to. And really, again, as I mentioned before, potentially be in a platform where we can uh, have grant funding flow through, through them. It's, again, similar to the California Emergency and Technology Fund and take that administrative burden off of the local cities or, or counties. And if we can centralize that into one organization that can manage and facilitate that, I think that will go a long way in terms of moving our efforts and initiatives forward. And that is my presentation. So we're open to any questions or feedback. Vice Mayor Jones, this is uh, Commissioner Paravania. First of all, I wanna thank you for, uh, and your colleagues for being here today. I think the presentation you gave was extraordinarily valuable. Um, you touched on something that, that I've always felt has been a major obstacle, which is, the people who need the information, obtaining the information so that they can use the resources. And I'm wondering in that new bill that you have in the works that is going to hopefully extend the $4 <coughs> uh, charge, if there's a way to incorporate some sort of process to disseminate information about the training program there. And I was also wondering if you were aware of the program that the state treasurer has to give um, small businesses loans to create better access in their business locations? So uh, to answer your, your, your first question, um, going back to what I talked about earlier, it's, it's really a multi-pronged strategy, um, working with our business ally program, working with, um, the different chambers of commerce uh, in, our, in San Jose, particularly the ethnic chambers uh, and, and the main chamber, uh, working with our, our, our business partners, uh, working with other government agencies. It's, it's a multi-pronged strategy in terms of, of getting the word out mm -hmm. and informing and educating um, these small businesses. It's, again, we have everything from micro businesses to you know, medium-sized businesses that are, are really struggling. And it's, it's a, all of the above strategy to, to, get, to get the word out, to educate. And you know, it's gonna really be uh, in the trenches, one business at a time, get that information out, educate, inform, and get them in the process where they can address those ADA compliance issues. And then um, your second question, actually I'm not familiar with the, um, the bill that's being introduced. So I, I'm, okay. I'd love to be educated on that. Okay. Uh, 
Angela, do you have any current information regarding the treasurer's office loan program? So currently, it's there has not been any updates, so it's not a current bill um, in in the works. From my understanding, it may eventually, because uh, we're new in the season of uh, less bill movement. But however, the information about the loan, I could yeah. send to your office and ensure that you can have it on your website for education as well. Hopefully that would be of, of great assistance to some of the businesses in, in the San Jose area. Definitely. Yeah. I'd love to hear more about it. This is Commissioner El Hessen. I have a question and also <coughs> want to um, make a comment. Sure. Um, so thank you again for your presentation. I think you did a really great job and I appreciate your initiative in actually stepping up to um, work with a resolution versus the fight issue, which I like your comparison. Um, having been an ADA evolution. coordinator. It was, yeah. it, was, it was definitely an evolution. Right. Having been an ADA coordinator myself for the city of Santa Monica, I know the challenges many businesses face and also dealing with the community. I wanted to ask, and I might have missed this, um, but are you actually, when a business comes in to make, uh, to have their license or get a business license to operate in San Jose, are you prov providing them information right away on access issues or so that way, right when they open their business, they kind of have a checklist to kind of go through. Um, I don't know if I missed that or if you are already doing it. I'm going to uh, refer your question over to either uh, Swan or, or, or Juan who are on the front front lines with, with that very issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, Juan, you want to you want to tackle that one? Yes, absolutely. Hi, everybody. Juan Borelli, um, the City of San Jose's Small Business Ally Program Manager. Um, we do have um, uh, a disabled access building handout um, that in the past had been provided um, to our customers, and it was available on the counter in the permit center um, when customers would walk in to renew or to apply for a new business tax certificate with the City of San Jose that was provided. We are in the process of updating that um, since we're not primarily having walk-ins, but it is still available online um, for our customers since our registration process, business registration process is entirely online. Um, I'm not sure if our finance department has that link to their website or not, um, but Swan and I are in the process of updating the handout with our CAS grant um, information, um, as well as um, adding some additional resources to update that handout. Um, but it, it had been provided in the past. Great, thank you. Uh, Chair Downey, uh, Commissioner Lemus has his hand raised. Uh, Commissioner Lemus, floor is yours. Um, yes, I have a question for the gentleman who just spoke. Um, it, the impression that I get um, and this is not just specific to your um, particular jurisdiction. The impression that I get is that perhaps one of the disconnects for me is that giving people resources is kind of volitional. And I'm wondering if shouldn't the brochure be more of like a obligation which means as a part of your licensing package, as your own checklist that you have in your county, what would be the problem with saying, I have read the following brochure and understand my obligations under the ADA and ensuring people didn't just skip that piece because I often as a small business person don't take all the brochures that are available in the small business office. It's not something I would normally pick up unless I was brand new and I didn't know how to do a business. And so I'm just wondering just in terms of process, if maybe we're being a little too like, this is not, it's more than a resource. It's actually telling them the things that we just heard from Chippy that they're complaining about. The, uh, the, the example of the $400 really bothers me because I, one, I, I, I think there's more to that story because if they're that poor, they wouldn't have to do the 
the change anyway under the ADA. And, and so I, I, I would definitely want to talk about that one offline, but um, is there, is it, what would be, what would be the downside of making them read it and saying, and signing that they read it, which means then your city is telling them you, this is not a resource. This is that you need to know this. Have, has that been discussed at all? I'm just curious. And this is just an example for the whole state. I, I'm not picking on your particular county. It just came up and I'm wondering because almost all of them do that same type of approach. Thank you, Commissioner Lemus. I think that was a question for me. Um, um, Juan Borelli, again, City of San Jose. Um, the, uh, we'll, we'll certainly take that recommendation into account. Um, the brochure does um, describe the requirements as requirements per state and federal accessibility requirements. Um, it's not a recommendation, it's, it's a requirement, um, but we can also take your suggestion into account in, in terms of something more formal, in terms of an obligation or something that they sign and date um, we would have to have um, our department management and city attorney look at uh, the requirements for that. But certainly it's a great suggestion to consider. Yeah, I love that idea. This is Commissioner Lemus. One of the reasons that I raised this in particular is because oftentimes small businesses, the first thing out of their mouth, and Chippy can probably attest to this, is they didn't know. And so that then gets the point finger pointing from, from people like us, then we look to where would they know and where they would know would be when they intersect to get their license. And so for me, the, the connection there is we should at a minimum be able to say with confidence to be able to pull out and use this documentation, you did know. Now, maybe you didn't follow through that's a different issue, but you can't say you didn't know. And I think that's the frustrating point that I find it doesn't matter with language, disability. I, I, I don't care if you're purple, green or polka dot. If you're going to do business in California and we're committed to a, a barrier free world and we want architectural access to be addressed, we have to have a way of ensuring just like the credit card companies do. I cannot get my credit card renewed unless I go over the terms and conditions and click whether I read them or not, I have to say, I read them and then we move forward. And it's kind of that in that spirit, we're already doing that in other aspects of life and the credit card companies do it for the same reason. They don't want one of their consumers saying later they didn't know. So I think that that, Put yourself on mute. I don't know how that happened. Thank you, Tippy. Uh, <laughs> at a minimum, I'm thinking that, you know, we should be able to get past the I don't knows and get into what do I do? And I'm far more interested in a, a business saying, what do I do? As opposed to I didn't know. And after 25 years, it's frustrating just to hear people say they didn't know if they're in interacting with 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 government so I, I i maybe it would be a new point of law i i don't know or volunteering but i would like people to have to sign and i'm a business owner and i have no problem signing you i'm not going to be able to say i didn't know anymore and so that 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 i think having them sign that would be helpful to all involved because if you sign something then it usually means you need to follow through and be aware of it and we'd um is some counties do that when they're talking about fire code things, the things that are very important. So that that's that's the point of frustration it comes from, because I am a number one supporter of small businesses getting information and resources, but I but I think we need to get past this I didn't know thing, and I think that government is poised to be able to do that by at least ensuring that they read the document. No, that's 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 great input, and I I can't disagree with you. Uh, just one correction, though. Uh, Chippy is my alter ego. It's, it's Chappy. Just want to. Oh, I'm sorry, Chappy. Sorry. All right. Yeah. Just, you, actually, it doesn't matter what you call me. Just don't call me late for dinner. Um, thank you. Thank I. You. Thank you. I have uh, two commissioners with their hand raised. Uh, first, it was Commissioner Wheelie, and then Commissioner Claire. 
Thank you. This is uh, Vice Chair and Commissioner Doug Wheelie and uh, Vice Mayor Jones. I simply want to echo comments that we had earlier today in our meeting and in that thank you for the work that you're doing. The purpose of the California Commission on Disability Access is to be a, a venue for dialogue between the disability community and the business community, the intent of which is to reduce the incidence of litigation in that arena. And so I want to thank you for the work that you're doing because the spirit of your work is aligned with the spirit of our work. And thank you to you and to your entire team for the work that you're doing. That is not to minimize the place of litigation uh, in this world that we live in, and in particular in the circumstances that we're discussing today. But we do better when we can sit and reason with each other and resolve problems. So I, I simply want to say on behalf of the Disability Commission, thank you. And I also want to say thank you. I am the immediate chairman of the board of the California Business Properties Association. We are one of the original founders of the Disability Commission. And we also have a similar interest in seeing dialogue and resolution outside of the courts and so from California Business Properties Association also a profound thank you. Well, thank you. Commissioner Clare. Uh, thank you, Angela. Um, first of all, to the folks here representing City of San Jose, great work. Thank you for this. I think it will um, serve as a model, hopefully, to other jurisdictions in its thoroughness in addressing many issues. I do have a question, and I'm not too sure to whom it should be addressed, but whoever may want to um, um, respond is, uh, is there any, in the package that you're providing to, uh, in this information, do you address lease agreements and the requirements for lease agreements that have been in statute uh, indicating whether or not a cash report has been performed, which is supposed to uh, uh, initiate the discussion between landlord and tenant? Um, just playing off a little bit on what Commissioner Lemus had mentioned, signing a document for which perhaps some of those areas you don't have control, is difficult and and so highlighting the um obviously if anything that they move into they do but if they don't own the facility making some of those improvements are difficult and so understanding and informing that they have a response the landlords have a responsibility in signing their lease with the tenants to disclose a lot of this information and so i was wondering if that information is a part of your package in order to facilitate or effectuate greater compliance um, uh, for individuals with disabilities? That's a great question. Uh, Swan, uh, do, would you like to tackle that one? Yes, hi, this is Swan Ha. Thank you, Commissioner Claire. Um, uh, upon meeting with, um, meeting virtually with customers now, I, we still do um, talk with customers regarding lease agreements and um, speaking with the landlord to make sure that their site is accessible or if it's been um, inspected by a certified CAS, um, certified access specialist, and if there's any um, any upgrades that needs to be um, that needs to be addressed before um, they can move in and start their business operation. And um, it, however. We do know we and, and we do understand that most of the time the uh, property owner writes it on the contract and um, say that whatever permits you need in order to open your business, the tenant is responsible for getting um, all proper permits with the city of San Jose. Um, however, we we do advise our customers and um, the tenant and our business owners um, of that. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, the, the little bit of clarity is that there isn't really a permit to um, operate a business accessibly. The permit is a construction permit, which usually needs to be assigned to an owner <laughs> um, in order to effectuate the work. So it's, it's a little, um, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it falling under that umbrella is not an generally inadequate response if they don't permit the owner to actually make improvements. So, because it's usually the owner that has to move ahead with that. But thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you.
Are there any other, uh, this is Commissioner Downey, are there any other members of the commission that would like to address this topic? Hearing none, are there any members of the public that would like to address this topic? Commissioner Downey, you have one hand raised. Um, now, well, three hand raised from the public at this point. And the first one began with Christine. Second one was Molly, and the third one was Michelle. Thank you very much. Um, so to, to start a little bit, uh, um, I'm the advocate with the Silicon Valley Independent Living Center. In the past, I worked with the YWCA in the uh, Women Entrepreneurs Program for um, Santa Clara County at the um, Palo Alto office. It's no longer there, sadly to say. But my point is this. Um, in that entity, we worked very hard one-on-one -on -one with uh, new business owners to bring their businesses in into fruition, helping them understand what they needed to know, all of the ins and outs. And one of the biggest concerns, not only from the standpoint of having worked for the Entrepreneurs Program, but also having a parent, parents, I should say, own two businesses, one Washette, one um, uh, actually an ice cream store in Los Gatos. Um, we, I certainly understand the importance of being um, fully committed to the customer because if you lose customers, you're not going to be a business. And certainly looking at the footprint of whatever property you're going to is of critical importance. For example, the business that my dad owned, God love him, I miss him. Um, the footprint was where um, there was a lot of open space for the customers to come in, enjoy the ice cream, to sit down in one of the, the chairs provided and granted back then. Uh, we didn't uh, have necessarily the ADA in our lexicon since we were open way before the ADA, but my point being is there are physical barriers, certainly, but there are a lot of other barriers, too, and we need to help the business person um, address those, too. For, so, for example, someone who needs the menu read aloud or someone who can't quite reach over the counter. We need to come up with ways of assisting folks that need that level of service. And um, policies and procedures, of course, are a part of any business. But we need to also think of not only the, the, um, the requirements by whatever jurisdiction and whatever policies and procedures, but we also need to look at the, at the, the understanding of the individual. And I like to suggest to everyone here that not, not only the cats uh, help the individual and go through an, and do a walkthrough, but certainly even before that, perhaps doing a series of educational uh, uh, community events to where we educate uh, new and upcoming and existing even business owners, large and small, on the importance of accessibility in all formats. And I'd also like to suggest that such organizations <laughs> as the Silicon Valley Independent Living Center, as the <clears throat> uh, Project Hire, as the CARA, which helps those with um, who are deaf or hard of hearing, this the Center for the Blind and Visually Impaired, and so many more here in Santa Clara County uh, can help in that um, process. And I'd also like to suggest to the CCDA that that become a statewide uh, process so that every community can increase accessibility and education for the business owner. Thank you. Uh, this is Executive Director uh, Jamat. I just want to do for the commissioners um, chair that the time is uh, 11. 
Um, just want to do a little time check. One, and two, I want to identify that Commissioner, Assembly uh, Person, um, Commissioner uh, Janet Nguyen is on, uh, joined us for the attendance in our records. And we have two hands raised. So just want to throw those three in. Uh, again, we have two more items on our agenda that we want to complete before noon, and it's 1136. So if I could, this is Commissioner Downey, if we could limit your public comments to two minutes, that would be appreciated, two minutes each. And with that said, um, I believe it was uh, Molly Mc, uh, was, yes, Molly was next. Hello, my name is Molly McLeod. I appreciate the focus that is being brought on um, accessibility and ableism. Um, as a person whose first job was in uh, McLeod Realty, um, my father's uh, side business as he was also a teacher. Um, I am um, sympathetic to the, bu the businesses and I also recognize that the city of San Jose um, by having small business allies and the recruitment focused on having um, ex very um, capable staff who are also uh, bilingual in Spanish and Vietnamese was important, very important. Um, what needs to also be ramped up is the disability expertise. Um, so there was a disinvestment in um, disability expertise within the city of San Jose in about 2017. There used to be um, liaisons in every single department and two staff people that worked on um, access related issues. Um, the current practice conditions are uh, internally in terms of capacity are low and that's significant because it affects whether or not um, the, the effectiveness of the ability of the organization to help small businesses and residents, all residents who are within the city. Um, the, for example, the ADA coordinator's manual is from 2008, 2009. Uh, the ADA was updated more recently than that. And when I go to business meetings and the focus is on the, the, um, uh, the lawsuits and there's the admission that no, we really wouldn't be making these improvements to the physical and also addressing the attitudinal barriers without this you know, becoming a hot topic. What I wonder is, um, you know, 31 years after the ADA and much longer after the passage of 504 is what will it take to raise our capacity, um, each and every one of us, and organizationally to better support um, businesses, but also residents. You know, when I think about our phone, that um, uh, smartphones that have text, you know, those are features that were focused for uh, people who are deaf or hard of hearing, and so many of us um, use it. And um, anyhow, I wanna just conclude by saying, um, there is much work to be done. And unless there is proactive enforcement by the state to weaken or take away other remedies um, is just asking for um, problems. That's my perspective, thank you. Um, I just need to, uh, sorry for interrupting. I actually have to, to leave, but uh, I wanna say before I go, um, again, thank you for having me uh, attend this meeting. And hopefully uh, during the course of my presentation, I got across the, the real value that CCDA provided in terms of what San Jose is doing, our policies that we've developed and our initiatives that we're moving forward. So thank you very much for the collaboration. And I'm looking forward to working with you in the future to, to move some of these initiatives forward. So thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Vice Mayor Jones. Um, we appreciate you. And again, your whole staff um, has been amazing. Um, yes, they dig a lot, they ask a lot of questions. <laughs> and, and we were um, grateful that we had information to help you make decisions um, to present to your council. So thank you uh, for your all. I do see one still hand. I don't know, if, uh, Michelle, if you were directing it to our speaker but we do, um, he's just indicated that he does have to leave. 
No, this is going to be directed more to CCDA. It includes information, but it is directed um, more universally. Yes. So, okay. I, Chair, is it indicated that um, we he would like it to be uh, limited to two minutes? If you mm -hmm. could, uh, we appreciate it. Yep. Um, so, I kind of want to tag in tag on to uh, Commissioner Lemus's point that it's. 31 years beyond the time to not know ADA law, ADA accessibility. And the reason people do not know that ADA accessibility is because of ableism. Um, when we focus on the businesses yet fail to include disabled people, we are technically failing disabled people and failing the businesses. Um, Disabled people experience bar barriers on a daily basis, if not almost some days hourly or every few hours. Um, and they have city of San Jose, as well as state, as well as other government agencies and organizations typically have an inadequate response um, where this, you know, and, and that's an ongoing failure. The so-called drive-by lawsuits, which I know also CCDA um, presented in their annual report as, you know, the, the cause of all this need for change, you know, um, but these lawsuits are all represent a barrier that was encountered by a disabled person. Now, the predatory part of that, the drive-by part of that, I'm not going to get into that, but, you know, as a new owner of a wheelchair accessible vehicle, I've only scratched the surface on how the ADA law is inadequate for van accessible parking spots. And that's that's largely because people don't understand, including myself, I didn't understand the need for that. Um, you know, it's time that we create a world where there are no, not signs that say disabled entry in the back, segregating disabled people and giving them less than equal treatment. It's it's time that it's better than that. And this world, um, this world, whoops, sorry. Anyways, it's it's time for us to be inclusive of all residents. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Commissioner Downing. With that, I'll move on to the uh, agenda item number six, the executive director's report. Thank you, uh, Chair Downey. I will be uh, brief on the presentations for today in this report. Our first is just to acknowledge we have um, been operating under the executive order 122 uh, that has been identified as um, extending the Bagley King uh, law regarding accessible meetings and that it's no not a requirement to be in an accessible location uh, for all members of the committees. It is now, the, the, the main point is that it has been extended to March of 2022, March 31st, I believe, yes. So with that said, we have been consistently trying to develop our strategies of how we're going to meet. As you all know, our full commission meetings have been um, always managed through caption, always managed through interpreting services. That's been a given. And we always had telecommunications associated. So it hasn't been a major shift for CCDA in accessible meetings, except in this area where locations. That has been this strategy that's been extended for all uh, boards and commissions and meetings for state government. And we at CCDA have been looking for a strategy of how we would operate going forward once it was um, the extension was released or if it's a continuing extension. Those things have been a part of our ongoing strategies. And so we have um, presented on screen our calendar for 2022 for all our meetings. In the October meeting, the board had uh, approved the calendar of dates. The dates that we have is published on our website. But what I wanted to spend the time just briefly to uh, state 
that we have been developing a strategy for hybrid meeting locations. For if indeed the extension as um, after March becomes no longer an extension and we go back to requiring that members participate at a um, accessible published location, we will then um, give the options for our commissioners to uh, participate in a hybrid scenario. That is, when we said hybrid, we will have our meetings in one of our uh, designated positions here in our office, or we have a couple of partners within our building who has, and this is a key for us, more uh, higher tech technology. We know that we've done this before where we had a meeting with a number of people there and, there's, and the sound isn't adequate enough. So we are already conscious of purchasing and desiring types of equipment so the camera can follow the sound as well as cameras uh, to position throughout a building. Some of our partners already have that technology. We currently do not. And so we want to make sure that if we go to hybrid meeting scenarios that those um, meetings location are in existence, as well as still um, those of you who like to participate in a Zoom or a Teams environment can uh, fully equally participate. So the calendars there, we, we have on the screen a de designate that we have as you're experiencing today, um, our meeting in Zoom, following the meetings, all our subcommittees are still through teleconference, that is, the legislative checklist and the education meetings are all considered to be a teleconference um, call scenario. So those are not changing for us. Um, the, the possibilities are that we're looking at is regarding the full commission and the executive. The full commission and executive meetings, we're looking at potentially providing hybrid uh, scenarios and how that would operate. We're still developing it and so um, on our screen, we have it noted in April, July, and October that they are hybrid uh, slash to TBD to be determined exactly where. So your calendars won't change in terms of your commitment of time, but where they may be may change. That's the key point. Any questions? The next... Uh, point that I wanted to uh, share in terms of administrative uh, is that in regards to our smartphone rollout program, um, DGS is uh, creating, again, the whole world is changing in terms of how we're operating, including CCDA and with under, within D Department of General Services, and the program of which they are rolling out to all their agencies or departments is what they're calling a team smartphone. Team smartphone will create an environment so people can telework and call in and out. People call in and call and they can call out through the smart telephone numbers. With that said, that changes all our phone numbers here in our office. So the numbers will not no longer be the same. Um, that was expected to be completed this month within CCDA. However, it's been de slightly delayed with the potential because we have questions regarding how that impacts those people. If we were to hire someone with hearing impairments or if someone calls us with hearing impairments, how does that tele the smart telephone work? And they are investigating that um, on our behalf for us, as well as for the entire Department of General Services. So um, that is something that do anticipate that the numbers may change. The only thing that you will know, the main line, um, we're trying to maintain, keep that number, but all our phone numbers will potentially be changed. Questions, comments? And then the last thing I just wanted to share is regarding outreach as you have um, experienced uh, just now with the city of San Jose, CCDA continually are looking to work in partnership with all our cities. We've had some um, 
has shared some really great conversations and they've used our data. It was, they were proactive. They saw our data in our annual report and said, wait a minute, what's going on with San Jose? And so that's how some of the conversations started. They also called because they are developing some programs internally. Those kind of conversations are happening through various cities partnerships and we continue to do so. Um, with that said, we've, we've had an um, opportunity to do one webinar um, to talk about um, our open air dining opportunities and just more education uh, that we can provide within the cities. We call it a kind of a, a startup conversation. And this was partnered with um, our state architect, Ida Clare, as well as GoBiz, where we did the webinar for um, for our audience. And we do plan to continue those type of webinars, conversations throughout the cities and actually actually partner with cities going forward. Previously, I, I had participated um, on a webinar with the California Lawyers Association. They've asked um, CCDA to participate and share. And so we've, we've gone from different uh, types of mediums of collaboration and we will continue to do so and find creative ways to continue to get our word out and our information out. Um, with that said, that's what I have for um, executive reports for today. If there's any, no other questions, we um, move on to our next agenda item. Just any comments from members of the commission? This is Commissioner Downing. Sure, Commissioner Downing, I do not see any hands okay. raised or any mention right. in the chat. Okay, uh, and any, uh, is there any interest of members from the public to address this item? Chair Commissioner Downey, I do not see any hands raised from any members of the public or any members of the public wanting to address something in the chat. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, we'll move on to uh, agenda item, uh, let's see, uh, item seven. Yeah, the financial review. Uh, we, it's now 11.53, so uh, we're making up time. I'll turn it over to uh, Phil McFall. Hi, thank you all. Um, happy late afternoon to you, late, late morning to you. My name is Phil McFall. I'm the operations manager here at California Commission on Disability Access. And um, I want to apologize. I'm really not in Paris. Um, I just realized I forgot to change the background. So please bear with me. I am in Sacramento, California. Um, first, I want to talk about our um, fiscal year 2021 numbers. Um, the government the, the governor has submitted his uh, budget approval. He submitted it on January 10th. So we, that being said, um, our close of year report has not been finalized. So I don't have finalized numbers for you. I will tell you that our operating expenses um, is, uh, you see there on the screen, a total authorized budget for the 2020-2021 year is $1,521,000. I do have a projected amount um, uh, for 2021, 20, 2022, which will be, it's projected to be $1,462,000. That's approximately $59,000 less than we had the prior year. Um, but again, that's a projected amount. I don't wanna hold, I don't want you to hold me to those numbers. I just wanted to give you an idea of what we're looking at for the 2021, 2022 year. And so, Again, I don't have any solid numbers for you today. I will tell you though that we are uh, waiting for that. We'll be able to report out on that hopefully in the next couple of meetings. Um, next meeting or two, we'll be able to give you um, a little bit more detail on our 2021, 2022 numbers. So um, Teresa, we can go on and go to the uh, high frequency litigant one. Okay. Next, I wanna share um, information about our high frequency, I'm sorry, high frequency litigant fund. Um, this is a bit of good news for us. Between the amount um, from, from that fund, the high frequency litigate fund, we've collected $99,000. Now that amount was collected between 2015 and 2019. Um, and we weren't able to access those funds during that time. So a provision was created to ensure us the, the time to, uh, to provide us access to those funds. And so beginning in 2019, we were given access to those funds and we have until June 30th of 2024 to access those funds and use them. So we can either encumber those funds or we can expend those funds, but we have until June 30th of 2024 to do so. Um, and so that's the key provision one that you're looking at there on the, on the, on the, uh, on the graphic. 
we um, we've also I just want to point out that we've collected uh, approximately another twenty thousand dollars on top of that ninety nine. So we have ninety nine thousand plus twenty thousand. So we're approaching one hundred twenty thousand dollars worth of money that we have expended that we can we have to expend or um, encumber before uh, mid twenty twenty four. So let's talk about the second key provision there. That, um, um, well, we have already I've already kind of addressed that a little bit. So anyway. The point I wanted to make is that we do have the hundred twenty thousand dollars available to us, um, and I know in previous meetings we won't have time to get into that today because I know we're getting ready. We're about four minutes out from being done here, so there has been there has been suggestions to use it, you know, to create additional checklists. Um, I know um, that some of the commissioners um, have talked about apps, so there are some different things that we can do with these funds. So. And then later meeting at another time, we'll be able to discuss a little bit more about what the possibilities are with this fund. But I just wanted to point out that we do have almost $120,000 available to us going through mid-2024, June of 2024, that we will have available to us. Um, Angela, I don't know if you want to expand on any of that, but um, that's kind of in a nutshell, a little bit of our, our financial review for CCDA. Uh, thank you, uh, Phil. Appreciate that. Uh, Commissioner Downey, you do have one hand raised <clears throat> from a commissioner. Uh, okay. Zima. okay. Commissioner Leavis. Oh, I was just going to note that I think you just went over, which was um, with that fund, that that $56,000 bite may not be as significant. That's all I was wanting to know. Was that included? We had the reduction budget. I don't it is. Um, that's, that's correct. The, the funds are separate from our budget line item that you did. Thanks. My apologies. I didn't make the determination. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Is Commissioner Downey, any other comments from members of the commission? Sure, Commissioner Downey, there are no uh, okay. comments uh, pending that need right. to be addressed. Okay. Uh, then are there any members of the public that would like to address this topic? Sure, Commissioner Downey, we do not have any hands raised for members of the public to comment. All right, well, thank you. With that, then we can move on to adjourning for lunch. And before we do, I wanted to thank everybody. I will not be here for the afternoon session. Uh, so thanks for everybody's participation and also for, for uh, uh, expediting things and covering everything in time for our scheduled lunch break. So with that, let's adjourn for lunch and return within an hour at one o'clock sharp for the afternoon session. Thank you, everybody.
Hello. Hi, this is Stuart Seaborn joining. Welcome, Mr. Seaborn. Thank you. Hello, hello, everyone. This is Angela. And hello, Director Jamad. It's Doug Wheelie. Yes. Well, Commissioner um, Vice Chair Wheelie is for those who are, were not a part of the morning session. Uh, Commissioner uh, Wheelie will be uh, hosting or chairing the second half of the meeting. And so with that, I see he's on, which is wonderful. And so with that, we'll, um, we acknowledge those uh, commissioners uh, for the second half to confirm their attendance. And then Commissioner Willie, we can begin. So um, staff, can you just acknowledge our commissioners for this afternoon by reading the roll call? Yes. Vice Chair Commissioner Wheely. Present. Immediate Past Chair Commissioner Guy Lemus. Immediate Past Chair Guy Lemus. Commissioner Dillard. Commissioner Dillard. Commissioner El Hassan. Present. Commissioner Holloway. Commissioner Holloway. This is Commissioner Dillard. Did, were you able to hear me? Um, no, but thank you. Um, yes, now I have you. Thank you okay, so much, you. Commissioner sure. Dillard. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Holloway. Commissioner Jackson. Present. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Leon Vasquez. <laughs> Commissioner Leon Vasquez. Commissioner Lillibridge. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Parvanya. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Claire. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Hurtado. Akash Rashi on behalf of Commissioner Hurtado. Thank you. Commissioner Jones. Nina Crochelle on behalf of Commissioner Jones. Thank you. Commissioner Mayenshine. Commissioner Yuen. Commissioner Yuen. Okay. Um, so Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Leon Vasquez. Present. Thank you. So, uh, Executive Director Dermont, we have uh, nine commissioners so far. Uh, we're still waiting for uh, Commissioner Holloway. I haven't heard anything yet from him. 
uh, we're calling to find out if he's returning. So uh, thank you, Teresa. I appreciate that. Commissioner Wheely, we do not have any uh, voting uh, subject matters the second half, but we will acknowledge those who um, join in as they do um, when they join the, the, the Zoom link. And this is Commissioner Wheely, I concur. Uh, we should proceed. We have no action items that require a quorum for a vote. And I think out of respect to our presenters, we should get uh, okay. underway. So by way of self-introduction, I am Vice Chair Commissioner Douglas Wheely, acting as chair this afternoon in the absence of our chairman, who's off doing great work elsewhere. I will be very active with my mute button today as best as I can. I apologize up front. I am on one of my company's job sites today in a quiet room, but in an environment that is not quiet. Uh, so I will call the uh, afternoon session to order and uh, announce agenda item eight, a legal presentation from Stuart Seaborn, Managing Director of Litigations at Disability Rights Advocates. And Mr. Seaborn, uh, the floor is yours. So uh, hi, everybody. Uh, it's nice to join you. I know some about the commission, but not as much. So I learned a lot actually from talking to Angela. I'm Stuart Seaborn, as uh, Doug mentioned, I'm Director of Litigation at Disability Rights Advocates. Usually, I, you know, in, in terms of dealing with groups like this, including the commission, there are some folks who know who we are and some folks who don't. Uh, we are a nonprofit legal center dedicated towards the, the civil rights of people with disabilities. Our primary tool is systemic litigation, and that means that we often bring class actions we do not typically handle individual cases unless there is some sort of system-wide policy issue or where the impact will impact, you know, in some cases, thousands of individuals. We don't have the resources to take individual cases, and we consider ourselves the litigation arm of the disability rights community. And you probably work in some capacity, some of you with some of our clients, they're often, most often organizations, they're most often constituent run organizations. So for us, by us, disability rights organizations, they often include the independent living centers, whether in California, New York, or, or other cities. Um, we have disability specific organizations we represent, such as the National Federation of the Blind, the National Association of the Deaf, the American Diabetes Association, United Spinal, et cetera. And again, we are often, because we don't do individual work, we're often out in the community meeting with organizations. We do what's called needs assessments out in the community where we meet with disability run organizations, again, whether it's independent living centers or disability specific organizations such as the National Federation of the Blind. And we go through what issues are impacting them and their constituents. The question always is uh, in terms of DRA's participation, is there something where there's a lot, you know, you're receiving a lot of complaints or there's something that could impact a large number of people, uh, like a policy change that would require litigation. Some background on DRA, and again, some of you may know this already, uh, if you're working in this field in California, DRA has been around at this point uh, since 1993. And we had two founders, uh, Larry Paradis and uh, Sid Walensky, both of whom were seasoned litigators. Uh, some had, they've done a lot of civil rights work, some disability rights work, but they uh, kind of gave up their private litigation careers in order to advance the rights of people with disabilities, in particular following the passage of the ADA. So it's no, no coincidence that this organization was started in 1993 uh, following the passage of the, a, the ADA in 1992, or sorry, in, in 1990. And they, they saw, I think, what was a, you know, although the, the, the language uh, has been beneficial in many ways because it is general, they saw the, the ADA as a blank slate to expand coverage around access and, you know, furthering community inclusion uh, through, through litigation as, as the primary method, in particular, given how uh, limited uh, in, in detail the language of the ADA was, and in some cases continues to be today. They also, uh, as they expanded, they often hired skilled attorneys with disabilities 
and created a fellowship program, which we still have for recent uh, law graduates or people coming out of clerkships with disabilities as a way to get hands-on litigation experience. Many of the, the folks uh, who have had these fellowships have gone on to become leaders in the disability community and the legal community, and we often work with them today. And then some background about myself. Um, I started at DRA actually answering the phones in 1995. So shortly after the organization was founded, I was finishing college. I didn't, at the time, didn't have much connection to disability. I had a friend who uh, was working at DRA. She was, I think, one of the first paralegals. And she literally said, I heard you wanted to go to law school. You could make five bucks an hour uh, at this new civil rights agency on what is, you know, groundbreaking uh, civil rights work for people with disabilities. I don't know whether it was the five bucks an hour at the time or the groundbreaking work, but I was immediately taken. And at the time, you know, given the ADA was so new and there were all kinds of issues that we were considering, you know, what, what we should take on and what not to take on, it was very exciting and it felt, you know, I imagine it, it, it felt like what the startups in the, in the tech world, it was, it was all new, it was uncharted territory. And at the time I had considered, you know, at some point going to law school, but the DRA folks ended up convincing me to apply. Uh, and it's, it's as really as a result of, of their work and guidance that I ended up in this field. And I didn't end up uh, back at DRA right away. I worked for the Justice Department doing antitrust work and then did labor law at a private firm. But the whole time I missed that sense of being out uh, in the community doing advocacy. This, this concept I mentioned of needs assessments is something they started early on. And I really did miss that kind of hands-on listening to the community and, and, and the kind of for us, by us organizations uh, and seeing where we could assist them in the context of litigation. And it ended up coming back to DRA in 2011. And as I've kind of grown up as an attorney, I've, I've also, so I didn't have much connection to the work personally when I started. And as I've grown up as an attorney as, and as an adult, I now have disability impacting my family. Um, my parents have mobility disabilities. My son has a mental health disability. I've had to put the, you know, the, the learning that I've done on the job into practice uh, at, at home and uh, with uh, in things like school and healthcare decisions. And it made me realize, and this is something that our, our founders have stressed uh, since day one, that, that you know, the concept of disability impacts us all, has a potential to impact us all. And the ideas behind you know, concepts like universal design uh, really should resonate. And you know, if, if they don't resonate, we've got to find a way to make them resonate because disability can impact uh, most, uh, and in fact, all people, you know, whether it's uh, you know, the, in, with the idea of universal design, whether it's strollers benefiting you know, people, I'm sorry, or, or, sorry, subway elevators, benefiting people who use strollers, parents, or, or you know, wider paths of travel, or older adults uh, with hearing loss who benefit from captions. These are really uh, you know, wide swaths of, of access and benefit, and it doesn't often get framed that way. I wanted to mention a little bit about the business model at DRA. So we do not charge our clients anything, nor do we make our clients pay costs. Even the, the organizations that we work with, they're, they're also nonprofits, and we don't make them pay costs. DRA funds itself uh, through attorney's fees recovered litigation. So that's, I mean, if that comes up for the commission, that's, that's something that is funding a nonprofit like ours. Also, we do fundraising efforts, uh, but at any given uh, year, our, you know, our fundraising could be 20% of our revenue and attorney's fees could be 80%. We are a nonprofit, so there are no, no principals or shareholders. Uh, the, the revenue all goes back into the organization and mission-driven work. Uh, which allows us to do things like take, uh, take risks, risky cases that could expand coverage of the ADA and the, and the state disability rights laws in ways that the private bar can't. I did want to mention a few examples of DRA's systemic change litigation as a, as a positive in terms of expanding the coverage of the disability rights laws. You know, living in California, we take sidewalk access and curb ramps for granted, but DRA was the first entity to get a precedent to, uh, to say essentially to, to the world that the coverage of the ADA uh, applies to the public right of way and sidewalks that was in our Barden versus Sacramento case. And now of course it is something we take for granted, uh, but that's something that the, you know, the founders uh, through, through working with organizations like the independent living centers really needed to push uh, early on. Also in the area of uh, mental health, um, we had a case Putnam versus PG&E 
was also one of the first litigated cases applying the protections of the ADA to mental health disabilities. Now it's, you know, mental health is obviously it's been the news for several years. We are, we're take, kind of taking those, those gains and applying them in other contexts. We recently had a case and a settlement agreement involving Stanford University. And the idea in that case and the settlement agreement is to recognize that the same types of accommodations that apply to other disabilities, such as physical disabilities, should apply to students when they experience mental health crisis, oftentimes in the wake of Virginia Tech uh, and other, you know, other things in the news, uh, campuses in order to avoid liability would essentially shut out students uh, who are experiencing mental health crisis rather than encouraging them to seek treatment and accommodating their needs. So that's an area we're looking into now. Also voting rights, uh, you know, up until, you know, probably about 15 years ago, the idea that persons with disabilities have the same access to a private and independent vote that the non-disabled public takes for granted was, was in question. And DRA, through its work uh, in our Disabled in Action case versus Board of Elections, also our California Council to Blind case versus County of Alameda, we, uh, were, the, we were essentially the first to get a precedent to apply, you know, if you're, gonna, if you're going to provide that secret ballot or that uh, private and independent vote to the non-disabled public, you've got to provide that to people with disabilities. That has led to work uh, that, that is ongoing uh, around absentee ballots and whether uh, at some point we can have online absentee ballots for people, whether with vision impairments who cannot read a printed ballot or people have limited use of their hands. So all of that is kind of built off the initial litigation around access to voting and the private and independent vote. Uh, we also wanted to mention emergency planning we, uh, several years ago, litigated a couple of cases around emergency planning for people with disabilities. One of the cases uh, was, was pled and filed before Hurricane Sandy in New York. Uh, it was against the city of New York. And as the hurricane played out, our clients were impacted. We had folks who were stranded in high-rise buildings uh, who then testified in the case. And as a result uh, of that case and, our, and the, the other cases we've had in California, we actually now have model emergency plans that we can provide to public entities that include the questions that need to be asked around access for people with disabilities. And just wanted to mention one more that happened in December. Uh, this, this was during the holiday break. Uh, so a lot of us were actually not in the office when, when the, the order came out. But this, this December, this past December, DRA secured the first order uh, in a large municipality, in this case it was New York City, requiring all signalized intersections to have audible pedestrian signals for blind people. Uh, you guys live in California, so you're kind of ahead of the game in that sense, but this is a precedent we can take all over the country uh, to make sure that the needs of, of blind pedestrians are not taken for granted. And these kinds of cases are all, I mean, it's, it's all litigation. Most of what we do, uh, you know, once we get a precedent, um, allows us to then go to public entities or private entities and say, look, there, this precedent exists. Uh, you don't, you know, you don't want to be in, in the same position this prior defendant was in. And the litigation leads to things like structured negotiations or work without litigation. But the impetus has traditionally been litigation. And with, you, with a statute like the ADA and actually with some of the state disability rights laws, it does present this problem where you, know, you have the Justice Department who's tasked with enforcement, you have other entities at the state and municipal level, but none of them have the resources to go out and do inspections, to do, out, do investigations, or to, you know, to, to take on the, the mantle of litigation uh, just because there's so much work to do. And you know, unlike things like you know, health and safety or environmental rules where they're often affirmative inspections, we, have, we often use the example of a restaurant where you've got a health and safety inspector going in there. And if you know, those of you who live in LA County know that there's, a, there's actually a letter grade that is placed you know, sometimes on, on the wall or the window of the restaurant. And most places we work don't have anything like that for, for disability. And you know, we're, we're 30 plus year, our organization has been almost now in existence for 30 plus years. And the ADA has been in existence for over 30 years and the state law in some cases for even longer. And there isn't the level of compliance that you would expect given such a, a long history uh, of requirements. And part of that is because enforcement is left in the hands of private actors with the private right of action and the regulators don't have the bandwidth uh, or the support to do the kind of enforcement, uh, whether through you know, investigation, regulation and, you know, and penalties 
that occur in, in with other consumer protection and and civil rights laws. So that it is is a bit of a quandary. We we do recognize you all have been tasked with a monumental task uh, involving uh, a high volume of disability rights litigation, in some cases serial litigants, uh, and among those cases, sometimes bad actors. So we, we don't envy that position, but we did want, you know, we often, when we go into a new jurisdiction, we often, you know, learn for the, you know, that the 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 judge or, or, or the parties don't know us as well. And sometimes we get lumped into this category of serial litigants. Uh, and so part of what we do is to, to educate folks about the value of, of nonprofits like ourselves, there are several, uh, and the value of systemic litigation as a tool for systemic change. So that's a brief introduction. I'm, I, uh, I, when Angela called, I was excited that you all wanted to talk to us. Uh, we have followed your work uh, from afar for several years. We've actually, you know, I mentioned Angela. We do, uh, when we're required to, we submit our our complaints and demand letters uh, to the commission. Um, but we also, you know, we'd like to learn more about what what you do and if there's any, you know, way we can help, if anything, to spread the message about the value of this kind of work. And I see something in the chat. I'm going to open it up because I'm. Oh, yes, I can. Somebody's asking me to connect uh, about model disaster plans. We Remind me and we, we can do that. We do have some examples. Um, this is Commissioner L. Hessen. I have a quick question. When you talk about public entities, do you include academia? <laughs> um, yes. Okay. So um, we so it, it, we have cases involving academia, and we've done work around uh, higher education for years. Um, we do have cases involving public institutions. So we had a long case uh, running against the University of California around access to paths of travel accommodations uh, on campus. So mm -hmm. so not just so facilities, but also things like effective communication in class. So you know things mm -hmm. like ASL interpreters. Uh, material that's accessible for screen reader users, that kind of thing. So we have had we've had a mixture of work with both public universities and private universities. Uh, our our settlement agreement with the University of California is about to expire. We've, we've been pleased with the you know the cooperation that's happened since then, uh, and we do use as I said we use these example these these cases as examples or models uh, with the idea that we don't you know our hope is not to always have to litigate. Right. What about K through twelve? So we do some K through 12 work. It's it's been I, you know if, if I had to look at our education work over the years, it's probably mm -hmm. been less than twenty percent. Mm -hmm. uh, not because there aren't a ton of issues going on right. uh, in the K through 12 context. We have partners in the community who do that work as well. So you know we sometimes work with Disability Rights California mm -hmm. around IDEA and you know mm -hmm. access to education rights for uh, kids in, in the K through 12 context. We do, uh, we occasionally do class action work. So we have a case right now involving a school district in Southern California where the district didn't identify kids uh, with disabilities. So rather than, you know, um, providing assessments for, for kids, uh, the district had these kind of alternate programs. They would put kids in that often didn't, you know, never ended up uh, as special education um, and in, in this particular case, this was a lot of underrepresented kids, uh, kids in the farm worker community, and uh, their parents didn't have access to information about special education. So one of the things that we've tried to do is, you know, look at disparities uh, mm -hmm. in access to services. And in this, mm -hmm. this example, there was a huge disparity between those who had resources and those who didn't. So we decided to take on a school district who was kind of keeping, you know, kind of keeping kids away from special ed uh, with limited resources. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. I see, and, and I apologize. I'm scrolling through these. I see another hand up. I think it's uh, Christine Fitzgerald. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Okay. So, a uh, fantastic work. I like the uh, the ideas of working with schools and, and communities and and the whole gamut of what you do. Uh, as an advocate for an independent living center, uh, Silicon Valley Independent Living Center, certainly we're one of the many uh, independent living centers that have really <clears throat> benefited from having uh, not only ourselves, but our communities be able to be involved in 
uh, uh, commissions and committees and all kinds of um, st city and state and local uh, uh, processes that they may or may not have had the chance to do if they have a disability where getting around or getting out is hard to do. I'd like to hear um, a little bit, of, and I, but I, I will admit I'm very concerned about the sunset that is coming up on uh, the assembly bill. I'm wondering um, what is being done or what could be done to uh, have this indefinite uh, extension uh, <laughs> continue indefinitely. Thank you. So I, I can't speak for work we're doing, but I know there are coalitions that are looking at th this kind of extension and the folks at Disability Rights California. And I, I was gonna ask the commission if you've had folks speak to you from Disability Rights California, because they are actually looking at this issue, how to, you know, how to address from the, from the advocacy community, you know, extensions that, that make sense to, you know, to, to um, certainly to ensure participation on commissions uh, from the kind of for us, by us disability rights groups, uh, but also to, you know, to look at uh, things like notice requirements and uh, other aspects that may or may not be, you know, be part of the discussion of continuing this kind of thing. So I, I would, I would suggest reaching out to them. I know that they are doing the same, you know, the kind of needs assessments we talk about with our litigated cases, they are doing that on this issue in terms of what's going to happen uh, with with the extension of all these uh, kind of disability rights, uh, particularly uh, physical access litigation issues that have come up since you know around 2010. I, I do. This is Angela, director, executive director, um, the commission. Uh, one of the things that, uh, Stuart, you will find, as we're doing today, that we create opportunities for discussion. Um, that is where our strength is. And for those who are new to listening in on CCDA's um, meetings, um, we know that we have our best effort of trying to provide equal voices uh, for topics so that everyone can feel like their voice is heard. When I, when I say everyone, it is the disability communities because at times we'll have even some folks say, hey, you forgot about our segment of the disability community. And then we also have the various businesses and the various types of uh, communications, even from that standpoint, varies along with our local government. So it's, it is, I think, um, where the legislation has done extremely well in creating this commission because we um, consistently throughout our years have always tried to bring all voices to the table and to look at that ball from every angle um, to help legislation make wise decisions as they move forward on a topic. So yes, many folks come to this table to talk. And, and this is why we thought it was so important for you to come and present from a, a, a lens that maybe some didn't even know, as you said, you exist. Many folks lump uh, the legal, the disability legal community in one bucket. And it is not true. And we wanted to make sure, like what you've done so well, to explain that there's various aspects of the disability legal community and you, your organization represents one of them. We appreciate. It. We wish more organizations, even like throughout the country, did this because you know we don't often get to express this voice. And there is, I mean, you know, we're we're one. We're part of a disability rights bar association, uh, where there are plenty of folks doing good work. You know, we work with partners all over the country who have made this kind of systemic change through primarily through litigation. And I know litigation gets a bad rap, uh, partially, you know, because of this you know recent history of serial litigants. Uh, but most of the folks we work with are doing exactly what we're doing. And, and that is, you know, they're bringing systemic change. The majority of the folks we work with do not, you know, they, they don't have monetary damages as a focus of their claims. You know, if it's there, it's not, it's not the focus. The focus usually is the injunction, 
the systemic fix. And the other thing that, that doesn't often get brought up and most of the organizations we work with, our clients and ourselves, when we do bring litigation, our goal is not just to, to get a finding of liability or you know, an order uh, that would that uh, you know says you know the, the the covered entity whether it's a public or private ent entity did wrong, but also that we stick around for the fix. In some cases, that means that we end up monitoring. You know, we have a case involving uh, the state um, Caltrans sidewalks. We've been monitoring that for 15 years, and that you know that's not the most exciting work. It's not it doesn't make headlines. Not the same kind of headline as filing the lawsuit. Uh, but that's part of the work, and in the nonprofit disability rights community, that that is, you know, that that is probably as much uh, of of what's done uh, as as an, you know, as whether it's initial demands and 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 requests for relief, et cetera, uh, and that part gets left out as well. So I think that you know, and that one of the you know, just going back to the litigation piece, one of the reasons that it's important, you know, to maintain the private right of action is just for that reason that that you know that the the folks who are doing the litigation work uh, have an incentive to actually stick around uh, and get a fix um, as opposed to walking away. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Seaborn. This has been a very interesting presentation. Before we draw this to a close, are there further questions from the commissioners themselves uh, to be addressed to Mr. Seaborn? Staff, perhaps you could help us ask. Yes, um, thank you, Vice Chair. Really, uh, we do not see any hands raised for the commissioners. Then we'll turn the question to the public, and I think I see at least one hand raised. Perhaps you can help us there again. Yes, Commissioner, uh, Vice Chair, Commissioner, we, we do have uh, a hand raised from Molly. Hello, my name is Molly McLeod. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Seaborn. I really look forward to seeing the model um, uh, disaster plans. Um, tomorrow morning, I'm gonna be part of Santa Clara County's Access and Functional Needs Working Group. I've been part of that for a couple of years now. And one of the things that I did was um, do send out a, a public records request that had to do with um, models the survey questions from region nine on how people with disabilities are included in disaster planning. And um, of the 15 cities and towns uh, within Santa Clara County and Santa Clara County, one of the responses stood out. Um, all of them were showed that there's a long way to go for or, um, the whole community plan, planning that includes people with disabilities. And that's uh, disappointing because June Isaacs and Kales has provided such wonderful detailed guidance. But I'd like to point out that the city of uh, Gilroy's uh, response said that Gilroy does not involve disability organizations in preparation of the plan. Gilroy does not have an ADA coordinator, currently have an ADA coordinator, um, Gilroy, does not currently have a process to consider the needs of people with disability. City of Gilroy does not have any accessible transportation vehicles for evacuation of people with disabilities. Um, City of Gilroy does not have tra train, trained staff for the function of uh, in shelters um, to be able to ensure that people are provided safe, appropriate assistance with activities of daily living. And their City of Gilroy does not have a plan for functional needs of people with disability. So the level of, of the bar is low from nothing to hire something, but still inadequate. And so the examples that you are willing to share, um, I just wanted to highlight the, the importance as a person with disabilities um, and, the, and the request to add this particular topic to the agenda uh, for this state um, level work. And there's a huge opportunity to collaborate with um, businesses um, and nonprofits, um, of course, as well in the solutions. Any thoughts that you have um, about the level of work or the ways forward would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. So I do think sharing 
examples and model plans is a good idea. I would actually, Molly, encourage, because we have folks who work on these plans in our office that I, would, I think would love to speak to you. And they could probably not only share model plans, they could I'm sure they'd be willing to share them with these public entities, including Gilroy. Uh, you know, there is there is so much out there now that that and June Kales, you mentioned, is one of the folks who was involved in coming up with some of this planning, uh, these planning materials. So I, I would encourage you to contact us offline. There's plenty of materials. It is really something, you know, it's been an outgrowth of the the first couple cases where I I, you know, I, you know, I would in terms of the carrot and the stick. I don't think litigation is as necessary anymore. In, it shouldn't be in emergency planning with people uh, for people with disabilities. But we'll, we'll, we can certainly share what we have. And I would encourage you, if I don't know if there's a way for folks to get my contact information, but I would encourage you to contact me and I can put you in touch with that team. I'm sure they'd be happy to share what they have. Any further public comments, uh, staff? Vice Chair. Commissioner Wheely, I do not see any hands raised from the public or any indication in the chat. Thank you. Oh. And Mr. Seaborn, thank you again very much for your presentation. Thank you for the good work that you and that Disability Rights does for the community. Um, we really appreciate your speaking to us. Thanks, all of you. Appreciate it. With that, I will close yeah. agenda item eight and move to agenda item nine, which is our legislative bill tracking and update and discussion. And our executive director, Angela Jamat, will get that underway for us. Yes, Commissioner Wheely, we do have uh, to be able to share um, current legislation of, that of interest to CCDA by our legislative uh, consultant from Department of General Services, Karina Roy. And I believe she is up and ready to share. Karina, I, you're on mute if you I think we can hear you. So Karina, are you not, can you hear us? Um, are you on chat otherwise? I will present. We are, again, this is Angela Jamont, uh, Executive Director and it's interesting now we are at the beginning of our legislative season. Uh, I was just in a meeting the other day and it was reminding me of that we're at the beginning and there's right now could be 2000 or more <laughs> bills that's coming fast through the legislation review. And so there uh, right now, just starting to get some new ones up, but I only have some of the previous ones that we have reviewed. And so um, I will quickly identify the ones that we have previously been tracking, but be aware probably at our next uh, legislative meeting, we'll have a number of new bills that will be on our list. And, but at current, um, I will share with you that AB 29 by um, Assembly Member Cooper on uh, regarding state bodies, that Assembly Bill is actually uh, dead currently. We were tracking it. Uh, it was last located as a two-year bill um, in May of 2021. And once it um, made it through at the last attempt to be heard, we will identify now that it is truly a bill that is not going forward. That was AB 29. AB 361, again, on the topic of, excuse me, I'm sorry, I didn't state the title of the last one. It was a state bodies 
uh, meeting on existing Bagley King Open Meeting Act topic. And the reason why I want to restate that is because AB 31 by R Rivera's, um, it is to an open meeting state and local um, agencies and teleconferences bill that actually became chaptered um, on 9 16 2021. It was approved by the governor and has been chapterized. And this bill is in regarding to existing laws on the Brown um, Act. And this particular bill runs uh, until January 2024, which authorized local agencies to use teleconferencing without complying with the teleconferencing requirements imposed by the Ralph M. Brown Act when a legislative body of a local agency holds a meeting during a declared state of emergency as that term is defined. So that particular bill has been passed and in chapters. And then the last bill of which I will be sharing with you this uh, afternoon is AB 1604 and is regarding the Upward Mobility Act of 2022. Um, and it's regarding boards and commissions, civil service examination classification. It was, it was newly introduced on January the 4th, 2022. It is currently in the Assembly Public uh, Employment and Retirement Committee. Um, I will read a portion of this uh, bill but again, it's AB 1604 introduced by Assembly Member Holden. It states the existing laws provides that it is the policy of the state of California that the composition of state boards and commissions shall be broadly reflective of the general public, including ethnic minorities and women. This bill will require that on or after January the 1st, 2023, all state boards and commission consisting of one or more volunteer member have at least one board member or commissioner from an underrepresented community. This bill would define the term board member or commissioner from an underrepresented community as an individual who self identifies as black, African-American, Hispanic, Latino, Asian, Pacific Islander, Native American, Native Hawaiian, Alaskan Native, self-identifies as gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender, who is a veteran or as defined, excuse me, who is a veteran as defined or who has a disability as defined. The bill would apply these requirements on, only as vacancies on the board and commission occurs. And this information was based on the text on January the 4th, 2022. So again, that's, we have three that we presented. A lot will be coming um, as the uh, bill season uh, go, is underway. But that's what I have for now, Commissioner uh, Wheatley. Are there any questions by the board? Chair Commissioner Wheely, uh, Vice Chair Commissioner Wheely, I do not see any hands raised from the commissioners. Then uh, Director Jamat, thank you very much for your presentation. If there are no questions, then we will close agenda item number nine and move to agenda item number 10. All right. Is oh. Director Jamat. Thank you. So um, at the executive uh, committee meeting, we talked about how proud we were of being successful in the migration uh, stages that we have conducted thus far of our data uh, information that has been collected manually since we started this process. We have uh, been moving forward, I would say, in leaps and bounds in 2021 to, to the fact that we felt that it was important to take some time to present it a little bit more detailed as we progressively move forward 
uh, with this effort in 2022 and 2023. So with that, we were able to have uh, with us today to present a little bit more detail from our DGS technology solution team. Um, presenters, Andre Garner, she is the DGS ServiceNow supervisor, as well as her developer, Weston Jones, uh, to present uh, some highlights of this migration process and how we have um, utilized their expertise to help us get to the point we're at now. So with that said, could they uh, come off mute and present their information? Certainly. Uh Hi, I'm Weston. I just wanted to show my face in the not so excellent lighting that's currently in my office uh, before I shared my screen. And first of all, just wanted to say thank you uh, for allowing us to join in on this meeting and present. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that we can go ahead and get this show on the road. Right. There we go. Uh, can I get a thumbs up if everyone can see that? And tell you what, I'll go ahead and get it to where we don't have that little pesky uh, little controls on the top. There we go. That should look a little better. Right. So first of all, once again, thank you so much, uh, Andre. She's uh, my supervisor on this project. And then I've been helping to develop this as was well uh, one other individual uh, named Chinakia. Uh, it's our, our team of three, so to speak, that has been uh, tackling uh, this project. Um, but as you can see, ServiceNow, uh, you might not know exactly, okay, what is ServiceNow? It's, it's, a, it's a very large uh, suite of software, so sometimes it can be a little hard to wrap your head around exactly what everything it is that it does. But basically, ServiceNow is just an automation platform uh, for allowing the automation of business and information technology processes. Uh, it can speed up and expedite a lot of things that are usually manually and digitize them as well. So specifically, in this case, this was for the CCDA uh, Portal Improvements and Enhanced Reporting Project. Uh, so not only did this include making the portal in and of itself better, uh, but also allowing for a more streamlined workflow and reporting process. Uh, all of you may not know exactly uh, or have interfaced directly with the CCDA portal. Uh, so as seen on the picture to the right, which is just a, a, an image of the login screen after you enter in your credentials. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you'll see an icon that says submit a complaint. After that, uh, continuing right, we have submit an amended complaint, and then finally submit a case resolution report. Uh, there is a menu bar at the top where you have access to a little bit more information, including historic submissions. Uh, but the main functionality is uh, managing complaints going forward, as well as having a little bit of a, a, a look back. But it allows uh, users, specifically from law firms or any other uh, entities that would be doing litigation, uh, to register, submit, and amend uh, cases, as well as registering their law firm. And it's a one-stop shop for case tracking and collaboration amongst colleagues. We did encounter some, some challenges and uh, the CCDA team did express these challenges to us. So we thought we could come on board and help to iron this out. Um, I will say this is an ongoing process, but we've already made an excellent amount of headway uh, since beginning to, to tackle this project. Um, as you see, we've got a very large number there, 17,000. That's the number of just historical records, not, not including current records. So historical is roughly around mid-2012 through 2018. Um, th those are all considered historical records. That's before we digitized everything to the portal. Uh, but those are the number of records that need proper or needed, I should say, because we've, we've already put a lot of work into it, um, proper law firm names so that we can do reporting on it as well as for historical purposes of, of looking them up. Uh, so some of the, the data was missing, uh, some was inconsistent, and this uh, greatly impacted uh, usability and the user experience, not only for the CCDA team, but also for individuals that were at law firms as well. So who are the actors in this and what are the roles that we play? 
you've been introduced to to us, the DGS team, a little bit, and and our role in this has been to uh, help migrate corrected data into ServiceNow and improve functionality of the CCDA portal to prevent future inconsistencies and improve the, the user experience overall. CCDA has um, been a, a fantastic in, uh, individual and team to work with. They've uh, helped to manage and approve the accuracy of thousands uh, of records and provide feedback from end user experiences with the improvements that we have made over the course of this project so far as well as uh, just a little bit of a highlight of our uh, accomplishments and achievements. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, we were told, hey, you're gonna have about 15 minutes. So we wanted to just keep it very high level. Uh, we'll have some time for Q&A, uh, but just some quick to, to rifle, off them, rifle them off at you, excuse me. Um, we've um, helped streamline the reporting process, uh, which has saved absolute days, and, and, and Angela can attest to this. Uh, ServiceNow just has some built-in features uh, that allow you to filter through data really quickly and gather numbers and really see the impact that you're making. And it's something that would have taken uh, many, many hours in Excel spreadsheets now can be done extremely quickly within ServiceNow. Um, we've also automated some of the, the processes, and we are currently working to automate um, some more of them. And then we've also, uh, this, this is a, a really big highlight, is we've remedied a lot of inconsistencies. Uh, so, for example, uh, we discovered that there were about uh, six uh, individual entities within the, the ServiceNow CCDA portal database where uh, individuals at those law firms had accidentally created uh, their law for more than once. So CCDA, they were getting calls saying, hey, where are half of our files? We don't see them. They're not here. And we thought that we, we had simply lost them or there was a permissions issue. And turns out we discovered through this project that you might have John Doe Law Firm, but then you would have uh, Susie at John Doe Law Firm go ahead and create, create Jane Doe Law Firm, uh, even though they were exactly the same. So these, these cases were in two separate places. And then if you're under the, the incorrect law firm, you couldn't see them and it was hampering collaboration and hampering the ability to actually go out and, and close these, these cases or, and, and amend them if needed. And we also discovered that uh, there were a lot of incorrect law firm names. So we were able to, or I shouldn't say we were able to, but CCDA was able to reach out to the, the proper customers and, and ask for clarification on those items so that we could get everything buttoned up and, and look neat and nice, especially for end users as well as uh, for reporting and uh, data consistency. And now looking forward. Um, so over the course of this next year, we are really excited about um, all of some, some items that we, we have on the docket and are currently uh, working on. Uh, the, the first thing that we're doing in this year is um, we're enhancing reporting. So as soon as we tighten up, probably in the next few weeks, the last bit uh, of data, uh, we're going to heavily lean into some enhanced reporting, uh, specifically with Power BI. And I do have a cool little picture to, to show you all that I will describe. Um, so we're going to look at creating real-time reporting so that at any second of any day, CCDA will be able to go in there and pull live numbers for, uh, for how many cases are by zip code or whatever they would like to, to see. So they can see where the most of the complaints are, are there certain areas to, where they should, uh, to which they should pay more attention. Um, and then we're also going to connect uh, d uh, digitized documents. So uh, I, as some of you may have experienced, uh, the, the CCDA process, especially historically, was completely paper-based. Um, now it may be more via email or directly through the portal. Um, but what we're looking to do, and actually I shouldn't even say what we're looking to, what we're actively doing is taking uh, thousands and thousands of PDFs and directly connecting them to the proper records that exist within ServiceNow for these cases. Uh, so the ultimate goal is for really anyone, since these are public records, to be able to go in there and look at these, uh, these disability complaints and, and litigation spanning all the way back to around mid-2012, um, which will be a phenomenal resource uh, to, to look in and, and see what the, uh, the, the course of litigation has been um, over the years. And then finally, we're also looking to further improve workflows. I didn't touch on this too much, but we've, 
we've done a lot of development in making sure that uh, when a case is submitted, that the proper information is included in the in the submittal, um, as well as any human error is completely mitigated. But what we're also looking to do is implement a, an approval process, uh, so that way uh, the data is even more secure than it already is, uh, as well as take a little bit off the plate of the CCDA teams, so they can focus on things that might have a little bit more uh, impact than just making sure uh, a record uh, it has its I's dotted and its, and its T's crossed. Uh, so finally, I'd just like to show you that, uh, that image uh, to which I was referencing. So on the left-hand side in the top left-hand corner um, in the, the small box that takes up uh, about maybe an eighth of the top left-hand corner, uh, we have a year drop-down list. And, and so what this allows you to do is select the year for the uh, complaints by zip code. Uh, so if I wanted to see all of the complaints in the year 2021, I would select 2021. And then on the right right hand side, which takes up most of the screen, uh, we have a map. And that map is color coded from light blue to very dark blue. And mind you, this is just a proof of concept. Um, it's not fully built out yet. We just kind of want to show you what, what eventually it's going, going to look like. So from very light blue, we have uh, places where there aren't that many uh, complaints that have been submitted. In fact, you might not have any complaints. Um, all the way to a very deep shade of blue, so it's a, it's a gradient uh, where, in this case, it could be greater than 57 complaints were submitted for a single zip code in the year 2021. And then also on the left-hand side, under the year selector, uh, there is a table. Uh, and on the top of the table, you have two columns. One is for zip code and the other is for number of cases. Uh, so what you can do is you can go in there and, and search, or I shouldn't say search, but you can sort um, to see which zip codes have the most number of cases um, or which zip codes have the least. Um, and you can scroll through the entire table as well. There is a scroll bar on the right-hand side. At the very bottom of that table on the left-hand side, it does give you the total. So as you can see at the time that this report was created for a proof of concept, there were 4,621 uh, unique records that were submitted or unique complaints that were submitted for the year of 2021. And that concludes our, our high level overview of what we've uh, been working on. And I would like to open up the floor if it's okay with Angela uh, to any questions. Mr. Commissioner Wheely, as our speaker has indicated, this would be an opportunity for uh, the commissioners to uh, offer questions first. Chair Commissioner Wheely, I don't see any uh, hands raised from the commissioners for comments. Thank you, Teresa. Then I will open the opportunity to members of the public. Vice Chair Commissioner Wheely, I do not see any members of the public with their hands raised or any comments in the chat. Great, then I will, I will uh, say, Mr. Jones, thank you for the great work you're doing. I mean, this is my ninth year on the commission. We've moved from the stone age to the 21st century in a very short period of time. And much of it is thanks to you and those like you who are there to help us do our work. Very great. It's our pleasure. Uh, Commissioner uh, Willie, I just, I did want to um, interject at this time for the record that Commissioner Holloway uh, joined the meeting earlier. Um, uh, he missed the roll call, but I did want to acknowledge that he's here as well as to publicly state it so it can be in our minutes that he is uh, in attendance to the meeting. Mr. Holloway, it is always a great pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. And now, Director Jamat, do we have our second speaker? So um, actually, uh, Weston represented both him Great. and Andre, yes. Thank you for that. So then, unless there are any further comments, I will uh, close agenda item number 10.
and uh, move to agenda item number 11, which I believe, again, Director Jamont, is yours. And thank you again. Yes. Um, thank you, Commissioner uh, Wheely. We are, are really excited about the steps that we're making in this year of strategic goal planning because it is very logical and we feel very hopeful to uh, aggressively complete uh, the goals in our next um, strategic plan of 2022 and 2023. However, for the sake of our closeout, we wanted to just to share again with the, with the full commission, our success of 2021. And with that said, I would like to have uh, Teresa Brown, an analyst for our data uh, reporting, to share the final results of our 2021 uh, strategic goal. So Teresa. Um, yes, thank you. Um, just to remind everyone, our strategic goal for 2021 was to evaluate compliance with CCDA's data collection mandate for researching 2020 uh, Title III construction related um, American with Disability Act filings and submission practices within California's federal and district, federal district courts, as well as the state superior courts. And uh, the research was based off of first collecting the data from a legal database, a LexisNexis database. And then from there, uh, collecting the data, analyzing the data. And from analyzing the data, then also uh, making recommendations from what we found from that analyzation. And so uh, currently our research findings were that uh, we were able to locate approximately a thousand additional records, uh, ADA Title III court records uh, within that legal database uh, that corresponded to uh, registered attorneys who had not submitted the cases to us. Um, what was also helpful in this research process is that we were able to also identify 1,600, approximately 1,600 additional records from other law firms that are not registered in our portal database. And uh, we thought that we would be able to find, uh, locate or identify more pro se cases. Uh, we did locate um, several handfuls, but they were uh, minimal as far as their significance or their impact on our data uh, analysis. And uh, based off of those discrepancies, uh, we were able to uh, develop some recommendations of how we were able to uh, address this non-compliance of attorneys cases that we were able to locate. Uh, let me move over to this next one. Thank you for the... Uh... So here are our recommendations that we would like to uh, explore. Uh, possibly a questionnaire to attorneys to address uh, reasons why they were non-compliant with uh, submitting the complaints to the CCDA. Also, uh, we'd like to consider the possibility of interviewing the attorneys to, to determine possible reasons for their non-compliance in submitting the cases to us. Uh, we've also uh, started to explore sending letters to attorneys um, and other disability access advocacy agencies to uh, provide information about uh, civil code section 55.32 that attorneys may not be aware of. And as well, we have already started to explore uh, working with a quick reference guide to make the CCDA website a uh, little more accessible to the attorneys is understanding what their obligation is and how to submit a complaint easily into our CCDA portal. And last, uh, we are 
offering the opportunity to provide training to the attorneys. Uh, we had the opportunity within uh, 2021 to work with several attorneys and bringing them into a more familiar uh, ease as to how to use the portal. Uh, and that has uh, actually helped in uh, bridging that gap of non-compliance. So at this point, um, I will defer back to Executive Director Jamond uh, regarding our uh, recommendations, as well as uh, this research that we have completed in 2021. So uh, thank you, Teresa, um, for that. We, we recognize that's been the, the theme that's been talked about all day is education, awareness. That's the way we know we'll be more successful. Example of already uh, in our communications that uh, occurred in 2021, there was a, a major increase of compliance just by us reaching out to uh, some known um, legal firms who did not comply. They were sending emails we talked to them, we under, they shared their concerns or questions why they didn't, and instantly we found ourselves um, dramatically increasing. So we know it's just education in many ways. Um, our example today with uh, Stuart Seabarn, who um, has heard about us but was questioning, we, he and I talked about, he wasn't sure about certain cases, should he send to us? It's about education. And so we're, we're looking at uh, discovering more organizations of which we could talk to. Um, as we reach out, we found this over 200 different disability uh, legal uh, entities in California that we can reach and educate. And so we have a, um, we're very hopeful of this strategy that we've laid before you today as to increase that number or decrease the number of uh, those cases that are in the uh, external ports, uh, legal ports, and into ours. So we're excited about 2022, uh, what we'll be seeing. Without any further ado, we can move into our next phase of goals for 2022-23, and that is to piggyback off what we started in 21 into what we're going to be doing in 2022. So um, to, today, presenting our goals, we have two uh, goals that we've set before us uh, within our five-year strategic plan, and that is uh, goal number one, a full migration of the historical data in the legal portal. What you heard from Weston, they're moving all this information into the portal and, and creating all these public-facing reports. Well, it's going to take some time, but we have some strategies, and that's what we'll be presenting to you all today. And the deliverables. And the second uh, goal will be um, recognizing that we have a parking campaign. It's been talking about over and over again that that is a low hanging fruit. And so that is part of our strategic goal for 2022. So presenting today, goal one is Teresa and presenting to goal, goal number two is Adam. So first, Teresa, if you can uh, begin. Um, yes, thank you. Um, as uh, Weston had mentioned before, uh, we have uh, begun the process of migrating our historical data into the legal portal. Um, happy to report that we have now officially migrated 2019 and 2020 uh, legal complaints into the CCDA portal. So that was um, a really great accomplishment. And so now we're going to tackle the remaining files of 2012 through uh, 2018 um, into the portal. And um, also keep in mind too, that we, uh, and besides the complaints, we are also looking at now migrating as well, the case resolution reports into the CCDA portal. Uh, it's a pretty uh, lengthy process. Uh, there's over approximately 29,000 records that we're working to um, transition into the legal portal. Uh, this uh, is part of our five-year strategic plan. 
And through 2022 through 2023, we are hoping to move those uh, files from 2012 through 2018 into the portal. And uh, eventually this will be a real time a reporting tool. Um, the public will have access to this, uh, which will help to create a learning and educational device for uh, understanding uh, compliance, ADA compliance of uh, violations that uh, we have been reporting for the last uh, 10 years on the, in the portal. And uh, attorneys will have access to it uh, as well as other public uh, organizations that would like to uh, do research on uh, non-compliance of uh, violations that have occurred. And um, I will now shift this back to Executive Director Jovan. So we'll, we'll go straight to Adam um, Basante. He's going to present uh, goal number two. I apologize. I thought my hotkey had done it. I, I'm sorry, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Um, as a, a brief review of our campaign that we began at the end of 2021, um, we launched our accessible parking campaign to address number one, uh, the number one alleged violation in the state of California. And this was actually in first response to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, with our development of our, outside, our outdoor dining and curbside pickup disability access considerations. Uh, for 2022, we're gonna be expanding the project a little bit to, to put more focus on um, accessible parking, uh, accessible parking uh, throughout the state of California. And we have three uh, separate deliverables that we're planning for, for this year. The first is which uh, is to develop our, our toolkit, and it's gonna get, which will consist of several planning meetings, partnerships with subject matter experts, and uh, our consultant that's, who we've brought on to help us develop these toolkits. And then our second deliverable that we're going to have uh, is once the toolkits have been developed, uh, to just distribute those kits uh, to uh, various groups and in, in, uh, throughout the state, um, all again pertaining to the particular subject matter that we're working on. And then the third deliverable that we have for this year uh, is to take feed, feedback and develop uh, any adjustments or changes that need to be made to the toolkits. Uh, we'll also be able to report on our findings and make plans to, to enact those amendments. So that's, again, just a very brief overview of what our intent is for this particular campaign in 2022. So are there any questions uh, for staff? That we can to respond to. And this is Commissioner Hessen. So this is going to be part of our committee work under the education outreach, correct? This is something we're going to be working with. Uh, Commissioner uh, Ellison, I always um, have this interesting way of trying to incorporate all our committees together. Uh -huh. <laughs> that is the toolkit itself and the, the actual meat of the data comes from the checklist committee. So it's, uh -huh. their, so it's their project on one side of it. The other is the education outreach who right. has to get it out the door and just turn who can participate. And then of course, if there's anything that comes out of our working groups that needs to be considered a part of legislative matters, then we translate it over to our uh, legislative committee to uh -huh. participate and assist us on. So we definitely um, try to be uh, wise in our structuring of our work efforts, especially as we have a small team not to have too many projects separately impacting each group, but nevertheless, your own role and responsibility in that. Uh, there right, are right. Some, some definitely uh, distinctive responsibilities that may not necessarily be identified and talked about in this discussion here from the ENO, but indeed um, you are impacted on this. Okay, so I wanted to define our scope of work 
and specifically in regards to our educational outreach um, committee. And then um, actually, so that we don't overstep our boundaries within the other um, committees and what they're working on. So I see that I think part of uh, the proposed partnerships relates to outreach. So I see us being part of that. Am I correct? And then, that is, that's correct. Okay, and then the other part I see would be to execute the educational tool, because I see that the design would probably go under the checklist committee. Is that correct? Uh, okay. Bullseye. Okay, I just wanna be clear as we're moving forward. Yes. Um, so those are, the, those are the two scopes of work I see us being involved in. Okay, thank you. There we go, I'm unmuted. This is uh, Commissioner Wheely, uh, Director Jamat. Uh, I am again reminded of where we have been and how far we have come. I remember early on sitting through a strategic planning meeting trying to set goals because we were a commission without one. And I, I want to acknowledge that under your leadership, yeah, and you certainly are on it, but under your leadership, we've developed goals and we keep refining them. And I want to publicly congratulate you and those you work with for being where we are today. Compared to where we have been, uh, this is quite remarkable. And I want to thank you. I want to open the discussion to any commissioners um, as to this report beyond the ones that we've heard so far, if there's anybody. And I see at least one hand up, staff. Um, Chair Commissioner Wheely, I, I believe that was uh, Commissioner L. Hessen um, just giving a applause. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Chair, uh, Vice Chair Commissioner Wheely, we, I do not see any other commissioners with their hands raised for comments regarding our strategic goals. Okay, and then of course we uh, will ask the same of the public, give them an opportunity for any questions. Vice Chair, Commissioner Wheely, I do not see any hands raised from the public or any mention in the chat for questions or comments. Thank you, Teresa. Then we will regard uh, agenda item 11 closed. And that moves us to agenda item 12, future agenda items. This is an open discussion for those on the commission as to things that we ought to be thinking about that we are not so far. Um, this is Commissioner Lahessen. I think um, a lot of the things we'll be picking up from what we were working on last year in relationship to um, our outreach and actually really making sure that we're known for what we do in the communities that we serve. Um, and so that I see that as being continuing on, but I don't know specifically that as we move forward in that, there'll be um, identified specific tasks and um, maybe sub goals or objectives in order to um, really implement some things as we're moving forward. Does that make any sense? Yes, and I thank you for that comment. And I think you are correct. We are picking up on things that we have been working on. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other comments? This is Commissioner Caravagna. <clears throat> We've got <clears throat> apparently some, some extra money that we didn't have before in terms of the money that needs to be spent or encumbered in the next couple of years. I think either at the full commission or perhaps at the executive <clears throat> committee, we need to kind of look at some ideas. It's difficult because we are always have um, more ideas than we have time and money. So I think we need to really be very strategic in terms of how we address this. And, and so early discussion, I think, is warranted. I share that. Uh, we have chatted briefly about that, as you know, at executive committee. There are ways to invest that money, perhaps, in software, hardware, social media, 
in order to enhance our presence and our effectiveness. There are many other ideas and I concur that would be something to take up in the coming year. Are there any other <clears throat> suggestions for uh, future agenda items? Been hearing none. Uh, I will uh, note this, that the legislative committee meeting coming up next is uh, February 9th from 1.30 to three o'clock for those of you who are involved in that. And with that, I will uh, move to agenda item 13, a motion to adjourn. This is Mr. Paravani is so moved. Thank you. A second okay. and a second. Any closing comments before we adjourn the meeting? Thank you all for a great job. I just want to say it, it was all informative and um, very helpful. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent meeting. Excellent Thank meeting. Thank you. Bye.